They say to understand a person, you have to walk a mile in their shoes. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. Ghana is the country where my parents were born. I've been to the capital Accra dozens of times, but this visit will be different. I'm about to spend a week living and working in one of the most polluted environments on the planet, Ghana's notorious waste dump, Agbogbloshi. I've been told about a rubbish dump that isn't just a rubbish dump. It's um, something that's new to me, it's an e-dump. So it's predominantly electronic waste. It's computers, it's TVs, rubbish that has value. Recycling West Africa style. Consumer electronics smashed, sorted, and the valuable metals extracted. This is where technology goes to die. I'm heading towards a site that 80,000 people call home, and where conditions are so brutal that many people die in their 20s. Apparently, it's one of the most toxic places on the planet. They found cadmium 30 times over acceptable levels. Levels of lead topped 100 times. It is a disaster of mammoth proportions. It's been alleged that the rubbish arrives in Ghana from all over the world, including the UK. But are we complicit in creating this place? And what's life like for the people who eke out a living on it? Agbogbloshi lies on the southern edge of Accra. It first sprung up in the late 90s when small amounts of electrical waste started being dumped on a disused floodplain. What's going on? Now, this 20-acre toxic graveyard deals in everything, from kettles to car parts, mobile phones to fridge freezers. It feels like there's just oil everywhere. You can see it in the water and you can just smell it in the air. I've been told to track down a team of young lads who work as burner boys. The people grafting at what is considered to be the bottom of the Agbogbloshi ladder. Hello. What's your name? Mohamed. How you doing? Are you the chief, yeah? Yes. You're in charge? Yeah. You're the boss? Is he in charge? They've agreed to put me up for the week in the slum and show me the ropes on the rubbish dump. If I can't sit. Mohamed. Who are your workers? Yes. What are their names? This Razak. Okay. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hello. Yaro. Yaro. <laughs> nice to meet you. So how how did you all come together as a as a as a team as a workforce? As a team, yes. Mudo ka mufto gari guda. She muka zo muka tara nanga muna zo ne waje guda muna bida. In five years now. Where did you come from? Because you're not from Accra. No? Uh, we are not. We, we have north the north northness. From the north. Yes. yes. Uh huh. Yeah. My family is from, well, I always come to Accra. Yes. But my mother's from Swedro yes. and my father's from Secondi. Yes. So I've never, I've never been here before. Yeah. I've never seen this yeah. part yeah. Yeah. of Accra before. Yeah. So it's a bit of a shock to me. Chief, look before Kanang Bunole. Yeah, I'm It's snowing Ghana, it's snowing. <laughs> well, we have to stand up and happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, New Ghana! Happy birthday, New Ghana! So am I officially part of the team now then? Yeah. I'm in? So, and right now we need to take you to the to there so that we can make the fire. Yes. What's this? It's this copper. copper. It's copper. Is this what you're gonna burn? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And the uncle. Yeah. So I come and put to work straight away. The burner boys provide a service. Cables that have been stripped out of old electrical goods can be brought to them at the edge of the site to have the plastic burned off. This is copper. So if I burn it, the rubber is all going to move it and leave the copper. And that's where the money is? Yeah, it is. It's not pleasant but it's the quickest, cheapest way of exposing the raw copper underneath. All of these bundles, are they yours? Yes. You have to go collect this one, come. 
Colette. Go, Colette, come, make fast. <laughs> Run! Daniel, come on, 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 come like that? The heat that is coming off of that is insane. And so how, how many hours a day will you do this for? Nine, nine hours. Nine hours you'll do yeah, this yeah, for? Yeah. Wow, the heat. I'm starting to get an idea of just how dangerous what I'm about to do is. Already, like, my mouth tastes funny and I'm spitting and I'm trying to get the taste out of my mouth. I mean, I've been here five minutes. The boys are paid pennies. The odd few notes are a bit of spare copper. It pays just enough to buy food, but rarely more. My boy, come! Bring it, be fast! Hang on, you're burning an air conditioning tank. Is there copper inside that? Fucking hell. What is it you're using to burn there? Is that a fridge? Is that a fridge door? The vast plumes of thick black smoke are already making me feel uncomfortable. <laughs> it contains potentially lethal dioxins and high quantities of lead. I've been told that being here for just one week, I'll be fine. But in the long term, it could damage the nervous system, attack the kidneys, and ultimately cause cancer. It's in your nose. Yes. Oh, you can feel it. How good? Yeah. It's bad. You see? Wow. Yes. Dirty. Blood. With only the copper remaining, the bundles are taken back to the yard where they're bought up by metal traders and ultimately exported as raw materials. The waste site is an assault on the senses, but it's only half the story. How do we cross the river? Over there? Yeah. On the other side of the river, a vast, sprawling slum has developed. So the work stays that side, and this is where everybody lives? Yeah. yeah. Officially called Old Fatima, it's often known by a more derogatory nickname, Sodom and Gomorrah. Home to some 80,000 people living within just half a square mile, it has no running water or sewage system, and disease is rife. But for the next week, I'll be staying here with 27-year-old Yaro. We're here? Yeah. Is this your house? Yeah. Is yeah. that a boat on top of this one? Yeah. Is that a boat? Yeah. On top? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I make it because of water. That's one way to make a roof. Yeah. Like most of the burner boys, Yaro came from the impoverished north, part of a massive influx of people lured to the capital in search of work over the past decade. A practicing Muslim, most of his money still gets sent home, but he hasn't been back for four years. It's cozy. Yeah. It's cozy in here. So you're going to leave me to be here on my own? Uh, I can leave you to go and stay in another room. Oh, you're going to be my neighbor? Yeah. Thank you for letting me stay here. I appreciate no, it. Don't worry. So this is where you stay with your wife or just? My wife in North, but I get my girlfriend in here. So me and him, we are sleeping here. So you have sometimes. a girlfriend and a wife? Yes. You know, our, our type of Muslim, we like each other. That's one so way, that's one way of putting it. The house is fine. It's warm, it's nice. <laughs> Cozy. Yeah. And you have children? Yes, I have two children. Wow, congratulations. Right now, it's time for pray. I 
have to make it here because I make late for the for the mosque. Yes. So you're gonna pray in your room. Yes. Okay. I'm a little shell shocked. It just feels like I've packed a week into a day. <laughs> I'm trying my hardest to take it all in, but it is a lot. So much so that my head's pounding a little bit now. Everything from the conditions to what exists just over there. I mean, you've got a highway over there where you've got a shit ton of people that are just driving past this. I've been one of those people. I've come to a a million and one times and I don't know this Ghana. I've got no choice but to get to know it over the next week. This is clean, it's dry, it's safe, and it's gonna be home for the next week. And you know what, I ain't bloody complaining because this is a lot nicer than some of the places I've seen today. It looks like he's put the fan together through bits and pieces he's found, I mean, it's <laughs> so impressive, I, I don't know how he's done it, but I know I ain't gonna try and put my finger anywhere near that to turn it off. I'll probably lose it. Although it's built on a floodplain out of wooden shacks, Old Fatima has its own mini economy. There are mosques, cafes, gyms, and even hotels, but there are no official amenities. Anything that does exist, like toilets or showers, have all been set up as small businesses. I've just made a consistent amount of schoolboy errors. So first of all, I haven't bought a towel. Second of all, um, I haven't bought any soap. So, I don't know if it's the smartest thing in the world to do, but I've nicked a bit of bar soap off the side. Tried to clean it as best I can, but there was like an array of pubes on this thing. <laughs> and I think I've just about got it pube free. Okay, should we get to work? Yaro, you're working so hard every day for a purpose. You're feeding your family, you're feeding yourself. Yeah. Do you have a dream? Is there like something you're working towards? In my dream, small time, if I get some of big money, I can, I can go and open a, a provision store. You want a business that can look after itself so you don't need to do this anymore? Yeah. How long before you get your own business, before you get provision store? But maybe like, I have to say like two years or I won't be back in the north. The group I'm with are one of several small gangs working on the site. Boy, I'm not a table of aluminum or carita, aqua pama. Is that boy? Each burner boy works with his own suppliers, and how much money he makes is down to him. But competition is fierce. The other one copper be some job, I will call him, but I put my small copper here. You take it. You you be fucking people. Twenty-one year old Awal sends most of his money back home to support his mother and seven-year-old son. He's hoping to get enough together for them to join him and his wife. He really doesn't fuck about, does he? Just gets it done. You, you seem to work harder than them. Ah, you, you work hard. Look, you're sweating. Look, look at you, sweat. In the water, yeah? Bring it. Put it. It's still early doors. It's not even lunchtime yet. And with the amount of copper that's coming through here, this feels like part of a chain, a much bigger chain. And, um, if the amount of men coming to these guys is anything to go by, there's a lot of people doing a lot of business further inside Old Fadamon. I've been told that the burner boys are doing the hardest and most dangerous work for the smallest reward. But further back up the chain, there are people making money. I've asked a while to introduce me to his main contact, the person who sends all his wires and ultimately provides him with a living. This is my, one my friend. His name is Baba Tunde. Baba? You see? Yes. Are you Nigerian, Baba? Yeah, I'm Nigerian, yes. Ah, I was going to say, I don't know many Ghanaians called Baba. Yeah. Baba is one of Agbogbloshi's money men. 
the people who bring the 40 electrical items onto the site in the first place. You see, Jesus, Baba, you've got so many computers. Yes. What's the, what's the business like here? Is it going well? Yeah, yes, it's okay. So what do you do? Let me show you. That's one way to get into it. So once you quit, crack into it, you remove the boards, right? Yes, yes, yes. See the way I remove the board. Ah. See, this is copper. Mm. You see? Mm -hmm. This is the copper. So when I when when I when I finish this matter, I remove all this one, I sell for him. I've been um, I've been spending some time today with Owa, yeah. and um, he's burning cables to get to copper to sell, uh, uh, and he's earning a little bit. How can this man? Mm -hmm. How can he go from being a burner to owning a business like yours? But that's their own business. They they love it. If they doesn't love it, they will not. They will stop it. Do you love it? They love it. Do you oh. love your job? Yes, you love no, me. No, because of... He doesn't love his because job. Of, because, not... maybe because, because of financial problems. So how does he graduate to another job? Does he need money? Yes, exactly. Money talks. He can do any other things. If I have money in my pocket, I can move anywhere. Let me see. Let me see how much money is in your pocket. No? Hey, whoa! Whoa! Hey, hang on a second. You've got... Play. Look at this. I haven't even seen one of these. What is it? Computer business. This is where you need to be. <laughs> wow. You guys, it's always you bloody Nigerians. <laughs> My God. Baba, it's nice to meet you, ma'am. Yeah, I'm you. sure I'll see you again. Yeah, thank you very nice much. Nice to meet you. Thank you. OK. Nice Baba specialises in computers and pays a handful of people to break down the goods he's bought into raw materials, like aluminium, silver and zinc. Nothing is left to waste, but it's the copper that's most valuable. Oh, well. Come here. Let me see the size of Look at the copy you're pulling out. We are burning <laughs> cable to get copper this much. And you're just pulling out yeah, copper yeah. fresh, this size. Fresh copper, yeah. All these are fresh. You see? You should be working here. <laughs> this is where the money is. So the profit on each machine that you break down will be how much in cities? Five cities. Mm. How many machines will you break down a day? Um, up to 18. 18? Yeah. That's not bad. And if you're getting five, six cities as a machine, it adds up. <laughs> I'm not going to ask to see your wallet. Thank I, you very much. I did. OK. Uh, I will. Thank you. Thank you. It's amazing to think that everything here was once just thrown away. In Agbogloshi, one man's waste really is another man's treasure. But for a burner boy, making money is a challenge, and that's if nothing goes wrong. So for all of that that we burn, there's yeah. only two cities? Yes. So do you keep much money on you then, when you have cash? Yesterday I put inside my, wa my wallet, when it fall down. You dropped it? But somebody take it. How much did you lose? 840,000. So it's like 84 cities? Yes, go off it, boy, go off it. That's a lot of, that's a lot of money? Yes. I'm starting to get more of a clearer picture as to why it's so difficult to have a different job and make better money because, well, I mean, if you're, if you're working here in this environment, chances are you've not got the money to buy goods to sell at any of the other areas out here. And unfortunately, to avoid this, you need money to start. So that kind of explains why there are so many young men here. You know, there's young men who haven't got an education, who have traveled down from the north to find money for their families. And if you've got no money in your pocket, this is the easiest way to earn. And if you're able to save, that's the easiest way to graduate to a slightly better job. Ah, oh, well, he was saving to try and make sure that he's not here forever. And it all went tits up when he lost his bloody wallet, like an idiot. <laughs> How much money did you make today? Today, I get only three cities. Just three? Yes. Instead of being paid money to burn cables, the boys often take a small amount of copper from their customers instead of cash. It's heavy. Yes. It's a good bag. Yes. 
hoping to claw back his losses. Awal is cashing in the stash of copper he's been saving up. Where's this copper for us? Make it ten. Make it ten. Just give the fifty. Done. Uh -huh. That's it. You see? You see? You need me. Thank you, Andy. Let's go. All right. Okay. Fifty cities. Yes. Fifty cities. Boyd buys fifty-three cities, or nine pounds. Awal is taking me to his other business venture, across the water in Old Fatima. Did you paint all of this yourself? Yes. It's a tailor's he's setting up with his wife. So how important is it to you then that you stop working over there, burning for copper? How much do you want to stop doing that? It depends on the scan. We have to do it with the copper bill. Oh. To me, my name is Banning, my name is Mia Sam. Awal hopes that his business will provide a decent living for him and his family. Right, listen, you take a break, let me do something. After what I've seen and heard today, I'm not sure how realistic that is. The Agbogloshi system just seems too stacked against him. But you have to admire his work ethic. And I think if anyone can get out, it will be him. Tasty, bro. Mm. Oh, no, I see why. Today was a good day. Hard day, but good day. My hands are even hurting. I can't even look. The skin's peeling off my hands. Look. See? Ah! <laughs> good night, man. Do you remember being a kid? And um, I don't know, maybe it's just me. <laughs> but when I was little, I was the kid that would put batteries in my mouth and get told, <laughs> and get told off for it. That weird chemical taste. Some of you might know what I'm talking about. That weird chemical taste is what I feel like I was subjected to pretty much for the entire day. I have no idea what the long-term effects of that kind of chemical and smoke inhalation actually are. But I do know they can't be good. I literally just fell in a cesspit. I was knee deep in shit. Literally. Fuck's sakes. <laughs> so it's a good thing I haven't got any open cuts on my hand, innit? How's my luck, eh? How is my flipping luck? Work here leaves you tired, scratched up, burned and bruised. So it's a relief not to be heading back to the site this morning. Today is Eid, the Muslim festival marking the end of Ramadan. Agba Bloshi is predominantly Muslim and everyone in the slum has taken the day off. That's one way to make an exit, isn't it? <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen an imam leave on the back of a motorbike before. <laughs> it's pretty cool. So long at you now. Prayer's finished? Yes. Fasting's over? Yes. <laughs> Everything's finished. So what are, you, what are your plans for Ramadan then? What are you going to do today? We have to find somewhere so that we can go and make parties. Come on. <laughs> With 
with all the work on the dump having stopped, I'm taking the opportunity to get to know some of the boys better. 22-year-old Razak moved here four years ago, following his elder brother down from the north. He'd hoped to find work as an electrician, but ended up as a burner boy living in the slum with his wife and two-year-old daughter, Barkisu. Are you worried at all about the health of your child being here, raising her in this environment? So if she does go to school, and what what do you want her to be? I or next day fine mm. because next day or be born nipa. What you say? And I mean, kura time no no or your doctor next no. And the yarbi achi me. Me bo bet my after you. Hopefully then you won't have to work mm. burning copper, right? Nice. Yes. Let's go. I don't like her here. One bit. You get. Ah, yeah. <laughs> You can't help but feel for these guys. Having to make a choice between bringing up their children on a toxic waste dump or sending them to live hundreds of miles away in the north. It's not a decision I'd ever want to make. But here, it's a hard reality. I've been here. I mean, it is Ramadan, so everyone's out and they're celebrating. And it seems like every corner I turn, there's a new party happening. This is turned into a night on the town with the boys, isn't it? Properly. You know, I realise I've forgotten how old these guys actually are. Their husbands and their, their fathers as well. They've got a lot of responsibilities, but on a night out like tonight, they're a bunch of guys in their early 20s. And when you take into account what they do for a living, I can understand why they want to let their hair down, right? Coming in. Let's go, let's go. After three days, I can see no one here has it easy. Life on Agba Bloshi is tough. As tough as anywhere I've been anyway. Most Muslims will be spending today celebrating with their families. These boys are hundreds of miles from home, but they seem to have found a bond with each other. Living here, it must be nice to think that at least somebody is watching out for you. Despite their close bond, the boys are trying to save enough money to move on from burning. Razak! Awal has been here for four years, but two days ago, he lost his wallet, containing 84 cities, precious funds he was saving towards his new tailoring business. Where are they going? They want to stop them about the money. My money we left, that's how I lost it. Chief, that's yes, I. This morning, though, Chief Mohammed has spoken to the gang and they've agreed to chip in and reimburse some of his losses. Half. Half is better than nothing, right? Yes. Chief, thank you. So we're going to Bush? Yes. Why am I pulling? Pulling. Armed with 90 cities or 15 pounds, we're headed five miles across the city, hoping to buy some scrap goods at the local electronics market and sell them for a profit back on site. Ghana has a well-established e-waste chain. Electrical items arrive here on ships from all over the world. Anything that is fixable is repaired and sold on. 
anything that can't be fixed, is generally bought up by wholesalers like Baba and taken to Agba Bloshi to be scrapped. Awal is hoping to buy himself a piece of the action. Yeah. Scrapping them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Scraps? Scrap? Yeah, scraps. You know how much? 70. 70? Yeah, 70. When do we transform it? We're transforming it. No problem. We're transforming it. What's the best you can do for all of it? 50. I'll give you 30. Yeah, but when you come from the ground. Aluminium is a copper. Where is aluminium? And I'm sending you a scrap. It's good. When do we? Where we are? Next time, I'm going to call you. I'm going to call you a number next time. How much? 40 cities. Everything? Yes. Awala's invested 40 of his 90 cities in scrap, but just being here is a gamble. He won't make any money today from burning, and there's no guarantee that he'll be able to sell his goods back on the site. Condemn, condemn, condemn. Condemn, basu. Condemn, condemn. What's up? Yes, I'm a mommy. I'm a sister. I'm a sister. I'm a sister. You know how much? I'm a man. I'm a 27. 25, clean. I'm a man. 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 i What's he saying? Seven cities? Mm. Seven cities, yeah, no man. So, no man's anniversary. No man's anniversary, 21. I'm going to take it, It's okay, small, one city. There you go. Next time, I'll arrange okay. more. You go call me, eh? Right. Thank you. <laughs> you know some other places to go? Yes. Having helped a while get his scrap, I can't help but think where do these goods really come from? In order to prevent toxic materials being transported abroad, the Basel Convention prohibits the export of faulty electronic goods. But it's common knowledge amongst locals that broken items frequently find their way into the country. Yes, sir, boss. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No scraps. No scraps. No scraps. No scraps. How are you doing? Yeah, where do your um, Where do your electronics come from then? The UK. They come from the UK? Yeah. All of it? All of it. And have you got any right now? Yeah, I have. Yeah. A surround sound? A surround was sound, yeah. Yeah, DVD, OK. DVD. This is from England? This is from England. Where specifically is it coming from? OK, it sounds from uh, Wimbledon. Yeah. Wimbledon? Yeah. OK. <laughs> and then, uh, what's it? Manchester. Manchester. Can you show me? Do you have any? Yeah. Uh... Shall I come in? Yeah? yeah? These are all from the UK? From UK. What part? Uh, That's Sainsbury. <laughs> That's from Sainsbury's. So, yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. So where's this one from? From UK. Uh, do you know where? What shop? What, what business? Well, because it says on the faulty, top, it's yeah, faulty. faulty. Uh, it's Curry's. Look yeah. at that. Curry's PC World. Okay, there we go. This one's faulty as well. This one's been sent for return. This one is an untested return again. So these are all problematic that they've sent. They're even marked so. So this is an untested return. Do you think these companies are aware of what's happening with their products? Uh, no. There's nothing to suggest these companies ever knew that these goods would end up abroad. And once they sell the items on to a third party in the UK, the disposal becomes the obligation of the new owner. Thank you for talking me through this. I can't believe I've seen this here. Let's go. The UK has strict guidelines that govern the destruction of e-waste. But clearly, some products are still ending up in Ghana. I'm actually a bit embarrassed. The fact that those goods are ending up here, it just doesn't make any sense to me. And the reason that I have such an issue with it is because I've seen what happens to those bits. They end up with Bubba at the computer shop and he smashes them up and then someone like Awal comes and buys the copper. And then he burns it. And then he inhales the fumes and then he goes to the hospital. It's not good enough. Let's go, let's go. I'm going. Back? Farama? Yes. Okay. Go back. Push it. We go walk. We go walk. I'm push it. I've got no idea if the goods on our cart are British or not. But with all his money invested, 
we start to head back home. Now let's go and sell it. Yeah? yeah? Let's go. Do you know where to go? Yes. They come for two. This one's about my buy one. How much? 40 for? 40. For the lap, for the for computers? This. I'd expected a while to break down the goods himself, but there's a sort of invisible order to the waste chain here. Everyone has their job, and I guess it's just simpler for a while to sell the goods on quickly. Please, let's go. Well done. Well done. Businessman. We are businessman. By the time we've sold all the items, it's almost evening. Today has been a gamble. And for our sake, I hope it's one that paid off. Tom Tom. Five, five, ten. One hundred. One hundred. Twenty. One hundred and twenty-three. 123 cities. <laughs> <laughs> Business mate. Well done. I must admit, I'm relieved. Having managed to turn a 33 city profit, a while is now back on track. And hopefully, it's enough to open a tailor shop for his wife in the slum. is doing everything he can to ensure that he's going to be okay. He stands the greatest chance of getting it, it being out of this. When there's desperation, people will do whatever it takes to feed their families. This morning, and um, <clears throat> my chest is just ropey as, and I can't really attribute it to anything other than the smoke. All of the boys have spoken about discomfort, but Yaro seems to be suffering more than most. Yo, yeah. breakfast. This morning, I'm supposed to be going with him to see the doctor, where he's arranged to have one of his regular checkups. Okay, so what is it you need to do? Oh, we have to go so that I need to talk with my boss. Some of my customers, they buy plenty of goods. Correct me if I'm wrong, what you're saying is you want to go and speak to someone yeah. now yeah. to guarantee some burning work yeah. for when we come back from the hospital yes, yes. where they're helping you they wait, wait with the results me. of yeah. burning. Yeah. yeah. So you want to have work to do as soon as you come back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go, Ekan. <laughs> okay. We'll go, I'll show you the man. <laughs> so he's having a chat now with a guy who's one of his best customers before we go to the hospital because this guy comes maybe once or twice a year and when he comes to burn cable, he's burning a huge bundle, not just a small one. So, the Yaro, it's important that he secures that customer instead of somebody else getting that business. We have to go. We go? My match already. You done? Yeah. Sorted? Yeah. Go. This way? That is the hospital. Uh -huh. Little is known about the scale of health problems in Agba Bloshi. Few people on the site are actually registered with a doctor. All of the boys I've been working with have been breathing in toxic smoke for years. What is the problem? My chest and my body all is hot. Okay. And headache. Uh, how long has it been there? The chest pain and the fever to like four months now. What do you do? In my work. Yes, what work do you do? Uh, I'm burning in copper. So do you know do you know you need to cover your nose before you do it so that you don't inhale all those? I know, but in our work there sometimes it's good for you, sometimes it's not good for you. When you cough, do you bring out any flames? Uh, uh, yes. Kind of 
Sometimes the color is black. Are you vomiting these days? Last week, I was spending me, I'm vomiting. Can you take off your top stand, face the window? Any pain as to what I'm doing? No. No pain? Any pain here? No. I've said something. Okay, sit down. Just sit down, man. Don't, don't put it on this thing. So what we do is we do a blood test. We we'll take a chest X-ray. And do you know some of the smoke and the things you are touching can bring you sickness? Sickness, is still you know. Still. And not know protect, not protecting yourself adequately. Do you know any of your colleagues working with you? Who coughs and uh, blood comes out? Yes, my brother's son. He, he is also, also here. Yeah. Sure, baby, bring him over. Let's have a look at him. Okay? I will bring him. Doctor, you were saying that you want some of his friends to come and see you as well. Uh, in your opinion, they should be coming more frequently, these yes, boys yes, that yes, are burning. Yes, yes. any time they are not feeling well, they should come. It's a problem, and uh, I think the Minister of Health will have to look at this and see how they can be organised in that. Because I believe, especially the, the masks, they need it badly. They will have to wear masks and then put the other protective gear. And I'm taking Thank you. The doctor's examination has identified potential problems. He's asked him to return the following day for further tests. So the doctor is um, is quite concerned. Something is wrong with the arm, and I don't think that he's quite given it the thought that maybe it deserves. On the one hand. It's easy to know how I feel about the burning. It's wrong. Yaro shouldn't have to breathe in toxic fumes all day just to feed his wife and kids and his mistress. But at the same time, they need this work to put food in their mouths. It's a living, but ultimately, it's killing them. Yaro. Yeah. How be? Oh, fine. How be? Mm. You weren't joking about going straight back to work. Have you been here since the hospital? Yeah. You finished? Yes, I finished. How much did you um? How much did you burn? Oh, look at this. Some aluminium. Yeah. So I have to take it to go and sell it. Is the plan to make the money as quickly yeah. as possible? See, that way we we'll go to the hospital. Yeah. They ask me about to cover myself. I can't buy my own hangulus. <laughs> I have been buying hangulus to protect myself. And how about your nose? I wouldn't buy the, my nose own. What was it that he said that made you want to buy the gloves? You know, they said that that kind of thing is poison. Right now, we have to change our life so that no, no more poisons in our body, so that we can live long life. What are the effects that we get it from there? Do you not know? You don't Has know. no one told you? Have you not like? Did, have you not asked until it's the first time that you've asked about the effects of the smoke? Yeah, I don't know the effects. Mm. Sometimes you get ulcer, you get chest problem. The money that you get, take it, cover yourself. You see, see the smoke they enter me. How the smoke they enter me? They enter inside my body. So the matter why I'm talking you that you have to protect yourself. As much as it's tickling me that Yaro um, has become an expert on smoke inhalation and um, what it might lead to, I'm actually kind of over the moon that he is not only protecting himself, but he's also chewing the ear off of a poor young guy about how he can actually give himself a longer life by just protecting himself while he works here. So if I come back in a year, he might be a doctor for the entire Burner Boys, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> I'm relieved that the message is getting through to the boys, but I hate to think what damage has been done from years spent inhaling the toxic fumes. 3-0. Three three Germany 3. Yeah. This is Barcelona and Kipa. Mm. Uh, let's take Hit the bar. bar. 
You still play football, right? Yeah. How good are you? I'm good no way. You play well? Yeah. Did you ever think that you might um, you might play professionally? Did you ever try and train? We've got to go to academy before. You at the academy? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Wow, when did you stop? Uh, because that time when my father died. Oh. Uh. So do you think you'll ever go back to playing football? Yes, if I, I, if I get money. Because sorry too, I, I want to travel. If I travel, I can still start continue my football. You still think there's time? Yes. You still think there's time to play for Ghana? Yes. National side? Yes. Do you not think what you're doing for a living now might affect your, your chances in terms of your fitness? If you buy that med medicine and, and drink it, you will wash every your body. <laughs> It's tragic to hear a wild talk about his health like this. The idea that he can just get rid of all the effects of the smoke with a bit of medicine. But I worry that unless these guys are taught about the dangers of the job, nothing will ever really change. It's my last day in the camp. I feel like I've started to understand what it's like for the people who spend their lives working on the dump. But I'm keen to speak to someone who can tell me about why the e-waste is still arriving and whose job it is to prevent it coming in. I've been told to speak to Fred, a local politician who speaks out on behalf of the residents of Agba Bloshi. Why is there such a problem with e-waste specifically? This e-waste issue is from the Western world because you don't bring it, then they won't do the work. And we have a clear-cut conventions and agreements. Hmm? Mm. Why don't you respect that Basa convention that we are not bringing that kind of waste back to these kind of developing countries? Mm. So the source, the cause of this problem is the Western world. United Kingdom is one of them, mm. the States of America. We are going to give them a gift. We are donating waste. And that is not fair because they look at the, the poverty aspect of it. What do you think the future for? For old Fatima is. Uh, I think that in as much as we know it's a very bad practice and that it's to stop, uh, but you have to find a solution to it before. Find a way you can integrate them, find good work for them to survive economically. The thing that keeps coming up is money though, and there will always be money in scrap, sure. and we will always have scrap. Sure. No matter how far we move forward as a planet, there will always be waste, right? People have to recycle, but recycle in an economic and healthy way. And you think that you are doing good to them. Absolutely, it's unacceptable. Absolutely unacceptable. Listen, it's been a real pleasure meeting you. Fred's passionate about stamping out e-waste in Agbuk Bloshi. And it's a relief to hear that at least somebody is fighting on behalf of the locals. But he's right when he says you can't just get rid of it. There's an established community here. People depend on these jobs to survive. Just shutting the place down overnight might do more harm than good. What is this? Burning here. Hmm? Is that from fridge? Yes. You see, it cut more. Yeah, but look at the colour of the smoke. It's not good. Hit this one. Hit them. Hit them. Hey. Need to get masked. Hey, I go buy it. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Why aren't you wearing it? Put it on. I forget. It's not. It's Please it. start wearing it. Yes. Look at you. You're the black swan. <laughs> Fast. It's supposed to cover your nose. Of course. Hey, wait, wait, it's hot. No. We need to get you some gloves next. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> I don't really subscribe to the idea of favourites. But he's my favourite. Kind of a cool guy. Range. With my time at Agbog Bloshi drawing to a close, I've built up a strong bond with the Burner Boys, especially Yaro and Awal, 
But as I come to say my goodbyes, Yara is at the hospital for more checks. Um, listen, thank you so much for having me. Thank, thank, thank you for you looking too. after me. Yeah. Thank you. Too. Thank you for feeding me as well. Yes. And giving me somewhere to stay. I appreciate you. I, I appreciate mm. it. All right, Chief Mohammed. Why are you here, Chief Mohammed? Say, get something to give you. You have something for me. What's that? <laughs> hey, you're making me nervous. What make you last uh, last birthday to go back to your hometown? Hey, you go. what's that now? <laughs> Copper. Mm-hmm. Ready, better boy. No, 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 Lazy burner boy. <laughs> yeah, look at that. Yeah, Lazy burner boy. Bye boy. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye boy. Uh huh. Hmm. Reggie, the prodigal son. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm leaving. Why, you are going now? I'm going. Oh. Friend, I'm going. Uh, go to the hospital. I see the... You the, get the results? Yeah, yeah, I get the results. They say? Yeah, they say I have blood problems. And my lungs, some of smoke. So they need me to go and take some of medications. Mm. Yeah. And how are you going to pay for the medicine? You're going to have to go and burn? Yeah, I'll come try and do some of work so that I can get the money to go and buy it. Yeah. At least today when you work, you're going to cover your nose? Yeah. And you wear some gloves? And my gloves. Smoke yeah. is a lot. Yeah. Smoke is a lot. <coughs> Plus, Yo. Yeah. I have to go. OK, don't worry. Listen, please look after yourself, OK? OK, I hear. Yes? OK. Make sure. I hear. Of your nose, please. Okay. okay. Look after yourself. I'll cover. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, ma'am. Reggie. Yaro, yaro. Okay, bye. <laughs> bye. My week here has been eye opening. Parts of it I've genuinely loved. Meeting the boys and staying with them in the slum. But I'm all too aware that, unlike me, they can't pack up their bags and walk away. The Burner Boys came to Accra in search of money and ended up stuck here. They're doing a job that's probably killing them. And the worst part is, we're partially responsible. You have the right to remain silent. You have the right to have a lawyer present to advise you before and during any question. They say to understand a person, you have to walk a mile in their shoes. But that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to jail to try and understand the American criminal justice system from the inside. America incarcerates more people than any other country in the world. And the largest population of inmates are housed in Texas. Quite a young age, I promised myself that I'd never find myself in this position, in the back of a police car. Never thought I'd know what it feels like to be here right now, but um, I'm, I'm experiencing this. Even though you know, it is under these conditions, I know I've not done anything wrong, I'm not getting a criminal record doing this, but there is an element of shame if I'm totally honest. I don't like sort of feeling like this. I don't like being in this position. For 
For one week, I'll be locked inside Bear County, one of the biggest jails in the state. I'll be experiencing life as an inmate to try and find out the real impact of being behind bars. So this is actually happening now. I'm about to head into the um, into these shutters, and uh, I guess once that shutter closes, that's it. I'm in. Yes, ma'am. You can change your sword and feel contact. One, two, seven, go ahead. Any kind of jewelry, any kind of personal items, any effects, anything like that? Just a ring. Just that right there? All right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this hand out of your handcuffs. You're going to put it on the platform. You have any inside pockets inside your jacket? Yeah. And that ring, is that ring able to come off you? Yes, it is. Can I get a fire? Can I get a fire? Yes. Open your mouth up, tongue up. Lift your tongue up. Yes, sir. Thank you. Go ahead, close your mouth. Every day, around 100 people enter this jail and 100 people leave. Thank you, sir. Go ahead, put your With the total population reaching nearly 4,500 inmates. So what's the reason for removing my jewelry and my shoelaces? Well, the shoelaces down here, number one, is for your safety and uh, for the safety of others. After being arrested, inmates are first placed in jail to await trial or serve short sentences. Stays here usually last under a year. Uh, do you have a history of drug or alcohol abuse? Are you expecting to withdraw from drugs or alcohol today? Do you currently believe that someone can control your mind? Uh, prior to arrest, did you feel depressed, down, or took little interest in things? Are you thinking of killing yourself or injuring yourself today? Thank you, sir. Come stand right here. You feel suicidal at all? I feel suicidal. Yeah. Have you been uh, seen by any kind of mental health or no. uh, put into a me uh, mental institution for any reason? No. It's gone. Um, I'm yes. A, yes. I'm a prisoner now. I'm wearing a pair of socks that have been through the system quite a few times. Um, even down to my underwear, you know, it's all county jail. Nothing about me right now. Um, it's come from me. Follow you There are 75 units in this jail, some of which provide additional support for inmates' physical and mental health needs. I'm relieved to be taken to the unit known as AA for low-risk inmates. So that's two tiers in here? Yes, sir. Shower area and bathroom over there. Your cell is going to be the first one, AA01, right here. Officer Torres, he's going to be the youth officer
Inmates in this unit are locked away for around 12 hours. For the rest of the time, they're sent to work in other parts of the jail or allowed a short stint in the communal area. Everyone's been let out of their cells at the moment, but I'm still in here behind mine, which I don't know how good a thing that is. <laughs> Yes, sir. What's up? How you doing? What's going on? What's up? What's up? What's up? My name is Rich. Jesus, man. You all right? What's going on? Reggie, nice to meet you, bro. Nice to meet you. What's up, bro? Reggie, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So you lot get a couple hours out here, yeah? Yeah. And is this is this is this time that you lot treasure? This time that you will look forward to? It's the only time you got. I'm keen to meet as many inmates as possible and try and get some advice on how to cope while I'm inside. What's happening, Reggie? Nice to meet you. Jeffrey. Mosley. What's that? Mosley. Reggie. You just gotta keep your mind occupied. You know what I mean? Like, you gotta read books, you know, just take your mind off the things that aren't really happening, you know? And what happens if you don't do that? Some, some people, some people, they'll, they'll trip out, like, they, they snap, you know? Like, they, just, they start to freak out. Because if you start thinking about the worst possible things that can happen to you, your mind go crazy, you know? You were so young. I, I didn't think that you guys would be. How old are you, son? 22. What did you do? Shoplifting. Shoplifting. What were you trying to steal? <laughs> T-shirts. You ended up in here because of T-shirts. Yeah. So what was going through your head when they put them, them handcuffs on? I was like, oh man. <laughs> I was so mad. I was like, man. I, I wish I would have just never did it. Over some T-shirts. Right. What Especially do you think your sentence is going to be? A month or two, but no, no longer than that. Because it's a misdemeanor, you know? It was just tagging on a projector in school. That's all it was. I took a pen, I edged it in there, all that. Oh, you're kidding me. Yeah, and the students saw me and they snitched me out, and I was like, oh, you guy, I'm gonna get you later. And you ended up in here for that. It's surprising to hear that crimes we might regard to be minor in the UK are punished by a jail sentence in Texas. It's dinner time in the unit, and I'm about to have my first taste of jail food. Oh, you got it all figured out. <laughs> oh, I see. You made a hamburger. <laughs> oh, man. Pretty much. It's just, it's horrible. I know. It's terrible, bro. <laughs> After dinner, I notice there's a new arrival in the unit. That guy's got a bag. That means he's just coming in for the first time, right? Yes. This is 19-year-old Alex's first time in jail. You got a window in here. You got more than I got. See, I didn't even know it was dark out. Do you know what time it is? <laughs> no, I don't. No, I do. Man, I don't. So this is this is my first night in here. It's your first night, right? It's my first night as well. How are you? How are you coping? Like, I'm fucking shaking right now, man. I'm just keeping myself occupied. I'm working out, I'm um, fixing everything I can. I'm just trying what is to... What's making you shake? Is it, is it... I haven't, I don't have... Anxiety, is it yeah, fear, man. is it what? It's just anxiety, man. And I have so much in my head that I'm not supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be at work right now, you know, taking care of my sister and my mom and my stepdad in Mexico. And he's on dialysis right now, you see? And I'd send him 200 a week and look where I'm at right now, you know? I lost the job, I lost my car, I'm homeless, and I don't know what's gonna happen to my stepfather. Alex has been arrested for possession of a small amount of marijuana, which I find out he was using to combat his mental health issues. I was, I got diagnosed when I was 13 years old. Diagnosed as what? Well. Bipolar, um, ADHD, and I was having very suicidal thoughts at the time where I can, I was hearing things and I couldn't cope with those hearings. And I was very, very out of there, man. I, I started taking the pills and those pills would calm my, my hearings down. 
but my anxiety would just pop up, man, and my depression would just pop up, man, and I used marijuana. And that's when I got out of that facility. And then I went back again because I started cutting myself. And then I went back again because I tried to overdose. And then I went back again because I tried to hang myself. Did you mention that on the way into this, into this unit? Because you know they ask you all those questions when of you come Of course not, I'm not gonna say yes to those. Why? Richard. Because if I say yes, that I have attempted suicide, this, it, it would just lead me to somewhere very, not even a very nice place. I, I'm very lucky to come to this unit. Because this unit, everybody is doing their, they don't want to fight here. They just want to do their time and go home to their family. If I was, if I told them I attempted suicide, they would have put me on some unit where there's more people would give me more anxiety attacks, more, more problems, more, more, more suicidal thoughts, you know? You can't be like this on your first night. You need to, you need to, you need to pull yourself together, man. I don't really want to be here, man. It's driving me nuts. I hate this place. Look at, look at the beds, bro. I don't deserve this shit. Come on, it's first night. It's my first night. You just gotta. You gotta get your head straight, man. Alright? Alright. When you're done here talking to me, you gotta promise me you don't want to talk to a guard because you need to speak to someone. You need someone to talk to, you need someone to be there for you, man. You got me now. You know that much, right? Right? <laughs> okay. I'm good, man. Alright. But before you go out there, just take 10 minutes and get your shit together, bro. You need to. Okay? okay. Stay calm. All right? all right? You got this, man. I'm about. If you need me, I'm, number, I'm in number one, all right? All right. Yeah. OK? All right? The majority of the people that I've spoken to have called this one of the calmest wings that they've ever been in. You know, they call this one of the, the safest bits of the prison, um, which is strange to hear because the minute you start to unpick some of their problems, very quickly, you see them teetering on the edge, you know? Already there's been guys in tears, there's been guys shaking in front of me, there's been, there's been people telling me their story and not been able to hold eye contact or, you know, or maintain a level of conversation where it doesn't feel like they're about to spiral downwards. <laughs> and this is the place where the most together guys are. After our conversation, Alex asks to see a counselor to tell them about his suicidal thoughts. What's happened with Alex? Is he still here? Uh, no, sir. Actually, he. He said he's having thoughts of suicide or self-harm, so we had him talk to one of our mental health counselors right now. Okay, so where, where do you think that will lead? Is he going to come back here or will he go to another, uh, another it's up, part? It's up actually up to our uh, mental health counselors. They're going to so assess they, him? They're going to assess him. If they feel that he is in danger of self-harm, uh, he will be placed in a uh, suicide protection uh, cell yeah. or a unit. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I'm impressed with how quickly the jail has dealt with Alex, and it's a relief to know he might now get the support he needs. different 
reward because of his his um, suicidal thoughts. I don't know where he's going to end up eventually. I just hope he's alright, you know. Given me my um, my toothbrush and toothpaste in a glove. <laughs> Even on a plane, you get more of a toothbrush than that. After meeting Alex, I'm keen to hear if there are inmates in the other units suffering from mental health issues. Once I'm let out of my cell, I'm escorted to the wing for more serious crimes, including murder. Where we're headed to now, what is it? What's right it going to actually be like? It's going to be set up sort of like where we just were. But it's high risk. What sort of crimes would they have committed? Like big possession felonies, big drug cases, um, murders. So in terms of atmosphere, is it going to be similar to where I've been? It's probably going to be a little, little louder. You sure I'm going to be alright? You're going to be good. There's an understanding the mood is real different in here, right? Yes. Without saying who, what sort of cases are the majority of the people in here called? In here? Two of us. Oh, yeah, murders. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, right here. Murder case, why well, I ain't do it. Second family violence, they enhanced it to a family. Drinking and, and, and drugging and being stupid. How many did this jail finally over 30 times since I was 16 This particular jail. And I've seen the same people over and over. Sometimes I, will, I think that they come in because they Issues that they don't know how to deal with out there. They, they come in, they come in, they're not, not really bad people, yeah. but they just fall in the same order every time. I want to know what help is given to the inmates on this wing who are dealing with mental health issues. Uh, I commend you, I appreciate what you're doing. Uh, I myself am schizophrenic, I'm a mental health patient. Oh, so are you receiving medication for that? Absolutely, yes. And are you getting counseling as well? Absolutely. And out there is I self medicate. How do you, so what do you use to self-medicate? What do you self-medicate with? I've done everything. Everything from, from pharmaceuticals to methamphetamine, heroin, depending on... Yeah. Get your hands up. Try, trying everything, you know what I mean? So. It's reassuring to hear that some of the inmates suffering from mental illness are receiving support within the jail. All right, thank you very much, guys. Hey, shut up, time, shut up.
return into the AA unit for lunch, I'm surprised to see Alex emerge from his cell. Hey, yo, what's up, Alex? Yeah. What are you saying, man? So where did you go? Because I know you went and spoke to the guards about looking at maybe... After we talked, I went and I uh, asked the guard if I can see a therapist or a counselor, a psychiatrist. The guard told me, if I, if I send you there, they're, uh, most likely you're having uh, suicidal thoughts. And when you have suicidal thoughts here, I didn't know that they strip you naked and put you in a cell by yourself. I was like, that's worse. So I told, I told them, I told them, no, I'm fine. But that lady, I was, I was telling her my problems, what I told you. And then she told me just to man up, buck up, and just do your time. And there's not much we can do because you're already here. I know it's tough and I know you miss your mom. And I was crying, man, I was crying. I, was, I miss my mom, you know? But the fact is, is that <laughs> there's no help here. You know, there's no help here. I couldn't sleep. Um, I had the lights on for a while. And then um, I saw you turn off your lights, and I was like, well, well, we, we, if we can sleep, I'm gonna go to sleep. You could see myself, yeah. you could see myself in there. Mm -hmm. It was our, we both had our first night last night. I saw you turn off your lights, and I'm like, I'm gonna turn off my lights then. So I turned off my lights, and I counted 100 backwards, and I fell, I fell asleep. Truth be told, I always promised myself that I would never be in prison, ever and to be here and to be complicit in the fact that I am still here is something that it doesn't really rub for me, you know, it's weird. I am the reason that I'm here and um, I can change it at any moment. You know, nobody is keeping me here, but I want to be here now. I think I need to be here out of respect to the fact that these guys are telling me their deepest and darkest. So, Night two, I'm about to get my head down again after having some noodles for the Indians. <laughs> and then it's another night in here. I think I might, might skip that 2 a.m. breakfast today, though. I think I might do that. Today I'm joining Michael, one of the inmates from my unit who has been given a job on the psychiatric wing. One. One in four. This is one of the only jails in America with a facility dedicated to mental health. This is what you got to wear, this is uniform. In there? I have no idea what I'm walking into right now. Yeah, why would you need boots? A lot of times the guys will flood their floors, you know, um, we gotta clean them all up and stuff like that a lot of times, and then we we have to do that. And uh, so we put boots on where you don't get all the you know stuff all over you, the feces and you know, mm -hmm. the urine, you know, and stuff like that. It's sometimes it's nasty, it really is. So how often and how regular is it that there's gonna it's be feces on a daily, urine? It's daily basis sometimes. in here. He does this a lot, stuff like that. Yeah. There are 52 beds for mentally ill inmates, all in constant use. And in this unit, they're confined for 23 hours a day. The first time you came down here, what were you thinking? Because this couldn't be more different to the pod that we stayed in. Oh, it's totally different, yeah. yeah. When, I, when I first came down here, I didn't know what to think about all this. And uh, it, it took a little bit of getting used to it. No, throw it up under the door. Okay. Right, Jail okay. staff supervise the cells, and a separate medical team handle the inmates' mental health treatment. Apparently, these inmates are all incredibly unpredictable. So during cleanup, they get taken out of their cells, and we're sort of left to work, um, work the mess 
as it were. So, let's see what happens. It sounds like this guy over here isn't the biggest fan of me chatting away on him. Yeah, he, uh, he thinks I'm talking about him. And he's giving me, giving me a name, which, uh, I've got a feeling this is gonna be, this is gonna be repeated the entire time that I'm in here, so. I'm gonna try and get used to that. Oh, oh man. Wow. I think if Alex were to come in here, it wouldn't take long for him to, to feel incredibly intimidated and not really be able to handle it. I'm in the state that he was in on that first night. If he did come in here, I mean, this is far worse. This is infinitely worse. It's not long before the inmate escalates his behavior from shouting to a dirty protest. I've not been told what sort of a mess he's made, but I can smell it. I want to know if what Alex heard about the suicide unit is true. So I'm going to see for myself. Normally, individuals with more serious mental illnesses are placed in hospitals rather than a jail. But with psychiatric beds in short supply, that's not possible for every case. How are you doing? All right. Um, so this is the suicide watch unit, right? This is the suicide unit. So what's different about this unit to their, their usual thing? Well, basically here, um, they give them what they call smocks, and they're not allowed to have towels with them, any kind of uniforms, socks, because they can use it uh, to commit suicide, to hang themselves or something. So all we give them is just a smock, and that's it. And the smock is the, uh, the green the sort of sheet, right? The green, that's about it. Uh, they don't wear nothing underneath other than their sandals. They're naked under the smock? Right. It's distressing to see how ill some of the inmates are in this unit. But what's more worrying is the responsibility for providing care for them is in the hands of a local jail. I want to speak to one of the senior officers about how Bear County balances its role between being an ordinary jail and a psychiatric facility. Hey, officer. How you doing? Hey, all right. How you good doing? Good to see you again. I'm OK. Right, good I'm, okay. All right. I'm, I'm still unsure where I'm allowed to stand. Am I all right, you're, you're good. Here? Yeah, over right? here is good. You're all right. You're all right. Black and yellow lines. Black and yellow. Black and yellow. man. Yes, sir. You're good. I've been uh, on clean-up duty today. How would you like cleaning. that? Not massively. There yeah. was a dirty yeah. protest earlier. We had to clean that up. That wasn't fun. No. Um, but the the the, uh, the psych ward. I mean, it's it's packed. Every cell is is full. Um, there weren't just doctors there. There were also officers right. as well. Right. I mean, who who takes control of that unit? Is there is there more doctors than officers there? And what, what's the balance? Security and safety is always number one. 
Uh, doctors, of course, doctors and nurses, do, you know, we, we don't overrule their medical advice. If somebody needs help, of course, we'll try to make sure that they get the help that the doctors and nurses can step in and help them. But first and foremost, it's always security. If there's something that's going to put them in an unsafe situation, we will step in for that to make sure that that doesn't happen. Some of those guys over there uh, really do need help. You actually get some of the guys over there that won't eat. They'll stare at you. They won't blink. Uh, they'll just just start talking to themselves. They'll start talking to other people. They'll start yelling. I mean, anything and everything that you can think of. I mean, it's not a movie, it's real life. It actually happens. So for some of these more extreme cases, mm -hmm. you know, the guys who are doing dirty protests, the guys who are, you know, in a cell with nothing in it and are wrapped in a, a green sheet, what kind of treatment are they getting beyond medication, beyond the pills? They do get to actually see the, the, the psychiatrist. So they do get that personal help. Whether or not they've gotten it on the outside, they do actually get it in here. They do get to talk to somebody. You so know what I'm saying? Counseling. They do get regular counseling on that. So they do get that. So if they move on beyond that, whether they get it or not and follow up with their treatment when they get out of here, that's something else to be said. But while they're here, they do get that part of it. And what determines when they get out? The, uh, them serving time for their crime or the mental health professional saying, OK, you are now stable? What, what's the decision? Their crime. Their crime. When their time is up for their crime, that's, that's when it's up. So in your personal opinion, then, do you think that they should be getting their treatment here or in a medical facility? Medical facility. I think they do need to get their treatment in a medical facility. This environment is not going to get them the help that they need. I think it's a quick fix. We keep getting the same people back here over and over and over again. I mean, there's people we get in here that come in here, you know, at least once a month for criminal trespassing. People that shouldn't be here, you know they're crazy. They can't even tell you what their name is. But yet we find them over here because they were somewhere drinking or, or they didn't get their medication and we find them right back and everyone can tell you their names. I mean, they, we know some of the same people over and over and over again. Right. Yeah. Bear County are doing their best, but with inmates often finishing sentences regardless of their psychiatric progress and many not getting the necessary help on the outside, it's no wonder so many come back again and again. When I get back to the AA unit, Alex is struggling to cope. What's on your mind, man? Yeah? Yo, Alex. Hold it together, man. Hold it together, brother, all right? So what is it that's making you so worried? What's on your mind? I feel like I've been here for a long time. But... Yeah. Is it just not having enough to pass the time? Is that what's getting to you? You thought about trying to get a job? They were supposed to be me I was working at medical with Michael, you know, one of the older guys. So we were cleaning medical, but there was a, a dirty protest. You know what one of those things are? You know what a dirty protest is? It's when someone makes a protest using their own feces. Ew. In their cells. Oh, wow. And we had to go and clean it up. Yeah, yeah I read you that stuff. <laughs> I thought yeah. I had it tough. Yeah. <laughs> like, you're sitting here in your cell, chilling, reading your Bible, and you're like, I got it tough. I was cleaning shit, shit <laughs> today. Oh, man. So why you think yeah, that you're having a tough time reading I'm your sorry, Bible, man. sitting on your phone? <laughs> I was like, I'm there trying my hardest not to get doo-doo under my fingernails, bro. Someone else is doo-doo. Oh, you don't get gloves? Yeah, I got gloves. I'm oh, just trying to make it sound worse than it was. No. <laughs> The longer I spend in this jail, the clearer it becomes how challenging this environment can be, especially if you're mentally vulnerable. So you not only have diabetes, but you suffer with depression, you suffer with depression. Have you ever had any, any issues? What have, you, what have you had to do? Depression as well. Depression. So do you think then if people were genuinely honest when it came to being booked in and ticked the right boxes, there would be a much higher number yes. of people that the institution were aware of that need help of and have psych psychological issues or mental health problems. Right, right. Of Just based on my own personal experiences and based on some of the things that I've been through in my own life, it's very easy for me to spiral downwards when things get difficult, you know, and to go into myself and to not want to really communicate or not really, really want to express myself. And I think that that's what's happened with Alex. He's definitely spiraled downwards at several points. I thought that this place would be about the physical. I thought that it would be about aggression. 
I thought it would be about throwing your weight around and making sure that people wouldn't mess with you when in reality, really, it's about what's happening in your own mind. And it's about the battle that you are fighting with yourself and letting anxiety and depression be. They're the two things that everybody I speak to seems to suffer with. They're the two things that everybody I speak to says this place magnifies, which you can understand because if you're sleeping in here every night, of course you're going to get depressed, of course you're going to feel anxious. This morning, I'm going to speak to the man in charge of the day-to-day -day running of this jail, Deputy Chief Reyes. What's that? Code 2? Code 2, yeah. What does that mean? Um, it's an officer in need of assistance. As soon as I meet him, there's an incident that needs his attention. I mean, it's, it may not be a fight. Maybe two inmates arguing. The officer's trying to de-escalate it. You've got an elevator right here, please. Yeah. Oh, i got to stay with you. I forget that. You look like an inmate running around. <laughs> <laughs> Inmate running probably doesn't yeah. go down very well, <laughs> exactly. I'm sure. Oh, this is Some a music, pretty fitting music on the way up to uh, Code 2, as you do. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Right. Just hold on, hold on. Watch out, watch out. Come out of the way. Yeah, stay to the side, stay to the side, stay to the side, move to the side. Move, 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 move. What the hell just So what happens is you have what we call a disruptive inmate. So the officer uh, initiated a code two so the response team can uh, come to the unit and prevent the incident from escalating into a use of force or to yeah. a fight. So who exactly are the team? I saw them in the mental health unit. Right, but the individuals. These guys, these guys moved a lot quicker today. Yeah. <laughs> so the individuals dressing green are what we call our special emergency response team. Uh, it's a really neat uh, feature to have in our facility, but they've received special training in not only weapons and tactics, but in, you know, crisis negotiation, hostage negotiation, um, firefighting. Hostage negotiation. Right. Have you ever had anything like that happen? No, here? luckily we've never had to deal with the hostage issue here. Once the situation is settled down, Chief Reyes explains the pressures the system faces in handling mental health. It, 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 we're seeing this all across America, that the jails are becoming the de facto mental health uh, facilities with the defunding of, of mental health hospitals. The mental health inmates end up making their way into jails and while our primary purpose is yeah. security, we end up having to serve as a treatment facility. So if the jail is acting as a treatment facility and you're treating people, how responsible for these inmates once they've been treated and their time served are you guys? 
While they're in our custody, we're completely responsible for them, whether they're mental health or not. Once they get released, then the responsibility falls on them to do follow-up care. And we try to connect them with the services out in the community so they can continue those care, uh, those medications. They're not going to do that, are But they? we can't force them to do it. They're all they're adults. Um, we'll reach out to their family sometimes. We have uh, certain restrictions on release. So if we know that there's a mental health individual who doesn't do very well at night, we have what we call a daylight release. Yeah, but you can't do that for everyone, though. I mean, I, I, as a, as a, as if I were a, a citizen, I wouldn't expect you guys to be running checkups on everyone. Right. I expect you so to, we, we to don't, be focused on the people coming through the door. Right. So you can't be responsible for the we, people once they leave. The jail doesn't have the resources to do that aftercare follow-up, if you will. But there are programs out in the community that specialize in that, and it's a matter of connecting those individuals with those resources. But like with anything, we can't force them to do it. Returning to the AA unit, I hear Alex has had some good news. He's been given a job while he's in jail and could, in the next month, be moved to a rehab facility to complete his sentence. How, go? How, go? How much long does that mean you'll be in here? A week, week or two, maybe um, three tops. How do you think you're coping there for another week? Because you've been kind of up and down. I got, I got people here that are good people, you know. And you've got a job now too, so you've got something yeah, to keep you occupied. Right? Yeah, I got a job. I'm feeding people now. <laughs> <laughs> so you're feeling comfortable, and you're feeling comfortable yeah, being well, here got, for more I got, time. I got more right here, and I got D. Right here. They're all good people. Yeah. Yeah, they're all good people. One of the things that did worry me about you on the first night was that you were having suicidal feelings and suicidal thoughts. Is that the case now? Do you think that, that might happen again? It it, just, it makes me think it makes me think it, but knowing that I have so much that if I did I have so much to lose, you know, so it's not worth it. I'm not gonna be here for long. I don't want to get too comfortable either, man. I don't want to be there at, at all. Yeah. Isn't that a good place to live? So, yeah, I'm going to keep my head up strong. And even though I have bad thoughts, I'm going to just pray to God. That's what I do all the time when I have those thoughts. Just pray to God. That's what my mom says. She says it can, it can rain for a long time, but it can rain forever. I'm not sad to leave at all. I'm not sad to see the back of this place, but I feel just really shit for these guys because they've got to stay here. A lot of people have got to stay here for a hell of a long time as well. But you know, they're good kids, most of them. They just done some stupid things to get here. I don't know, man, I mean, nobody's here by accident. Everybody's done something. But in my humble opinion, should they all be here? Should they all be in jail for what they've done? No. Come on, man, if you're 19 and you steal a t-shirt, should you go to jail for a month? I just breathe resentment. I don't think that that rehabilitates. So I am looking forward to getting my ass out of here because this isn't a place for me by any means. But you know, I've met some good people who've done some stupid things and hopefully won't be seeing this place again, but who knows? I'll be leaving tomorrow morning and as Alex is due to start a night shift in his new job, I say my goodbyes now. Hey, Reg. By the time you wake up in the morning, I'll probably be out here. Because yeah. I'm going to go first thing pretty much about I don't know, 10, 11 o'clock, I reckon I'll be, oh, wow. I'll be out here. So you'll still be working, if not fast asleep, right? Yeah. All right, man. Pleasure right. meeting you, man. You too, Reggie. Oh, come here, bro. Come on, bro. Yeah, come on. Hey, hey, I never got your last name. Yates. Yates? Yeah. I, not Gates, Yates. <laughs> yeah. All right, all right, all right. All right. I'll keep your head up, man. Reggie Yates. I'm going to look you up, man. Please do. All right. Right. Man, there's no direct windows to the sunlight. <laughs> so you have to sort of judge by little bits of light that come through and it looks like there might just be a nice bit of sun out there today. Perfect day for release, I think.
Hey, be careful, bro. I'm trying. Hey, I'm out. Right, man. Nice to meet you. Just being as close to the exit, the way you can already feel. You can feel how different the air feels in your face, and it just smells different down there as well. All right, sir, give me there. Can you have a seat on that metal bench? We'll be right with you. Yates, Reginald! That's me. Good luck. One of each, one at a time. As my time here comes to an end, I can't help but question whether jail is the right environment for some of the inmates I've met. Every item of clothing that I put on, I'm starting to feel more and more like me again. <laughs> it's the strangest feeling in the world. Incarcerating such large numbers of people for such low-level crimes seems to create more problems than it solves. Bear County are doing more for the mentally ill than most jails. But the system as a whole has some way to go before it's really working for those who need it. Eyes are killing me. <laughs> oh. Never again. They say to understand a person, you have to walk a mile in their shoes. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. One year ago, I spent a week behind bars living as an inmate in Texas. I found a system which incarcerates more people than anywhere else on earth, straining at the seams. I am looking forward to getting my ass out of here. And hopefully you won't be seeing this place again, but who knows? Now I'm in North Carolina, heading back to jail. Only this time, I'll be working as a guard. I knew going into jail as an inmate, I'd faced issues that I couldn't even imagine. I know that this is gonna turn up and, and throw up some real challenging things within me in terms of the way that I see the importance of the role and also who takes on that role with law enforcement. I'm looking forward to this as much as I'm nervous about it. What's it like working inside a system that's operating under unprecedented scrutiny and is finding it harder than ever to recruit staff? You throw into the mix corruption and you throw into the mix issues with uh, uh, race relations and racism. Who are the good guys and who are the bad guys, really? And what side am I on going in?
Guilford County Jail in Greensboro, North Carolina, houses up to 900 inmates. People have been picked up on charges ranging from misdemeanors to murder. Within these walls, they await trial, guarded by a staff of over 200 correctional officers. And for the next week, yours truly. Corporal Jackson. Hello. How you doing? Reggie. Corporal Jackson. Nice to, nice meet, to meet you. you How you doing? Good, good. Before my first shift, I'm meeting Corporal Jackson, Benedict. the jail's recruitment officer who interviews every new candidate. All right, Mr. Yates, we're going to go over some questions. Uh, the first question I want to know, um, how do you feel about working all night from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m.? I'd like to think I'd be fine in that environment. We have to deal with individuals as they come off the street. Oftentimes, they're uh, on drugs or they're intoxicated. Uh, some homeless people. Um, you're gonna have to search these individuals, which requires you putting hands on people who have uh, not bathed in quite some time. If it's a part of the job, then it's, it's something I guess I'll have to do. Okay. Tell me your thought process of you involved in an altercation, getting physical with, 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 with an inmate. Um, it's something that I'd be willing to do, especially if other inmates were at risk or, or I was. Uh, if you work in this line of business, it's gonna happen at some point in time. It's not if, it's a matter of when. All right, Mr. Yates, I want you to take a look at this video of the incidents that we deal with every single day. If you're thinking about becoming a member of our team, we want to show you this video. Some of this may be unsettling, but this is what we deal with on an everyday basis. <laughs> We're just gonna step Fuck you, nigga! I want what you want to! I'll be your goddamn nigga! <laughs> Hell yeah! Do your goddamn job! You monkey head motherfuckers! No, you relax, motherfucker. You relax, motherfucker. You relax. Yeah, I'll hold my foot, but I'm not taking my shoes and socks off for you. These are the type of individuals he's intoxicated coming in, do not want to comply, and so you have to, you know, we may have to use some force to get him in. Uh oh. Watching this video as a new recruit, I'm not exactly looking forward to my first shift. This ends our interview for today. Okay. And here we go. Correctional officers are paid £28,000 as a starting wage, well above the state average. Despite the generous package, Guilford County currently has a 20% staff shortage, 55 vacancies they simply cannot fill. The slack is picked up by the guards. Here, overtime is the norm. Do you know what, in all honesty, I don't think I am looking forward to this. I'm excited about the prospect of the challenge, but being back in a facility like this again and just being around those orange jumpsuits doesn't really fill me with excitement. It's gonna be a long week. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. <laughs>first shift starts at 6 in the evening. I'll be working on bookings for the night, where all new inmates get processed. I will walk you through it step by step. Learning here is done on the job, and I'll be working under the guidance of Training Officer King, a Greensboro native with over 30 years experience working in corrections. And he has some early advice for me. Um, it's something that I call the three C's. Three C's. Communication, confidence, and courtesy. Now me, courtesy is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. So when they see that you treat them as a person first, that's where you gain the respect. Hello. How are you doing? I'm Reggie. Nice to meet you, Reggie. Nice to meet you, so it's my first night. It's your first night? night? I'm working, yeah, I'm working night shift tonight. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Is this his very first day? Yeah, very first day. So he's like gonna be under training with you? FTO. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No better officer, I'm telling yeah. you. Do you remember your first night? Yeah. Do I remember it? Yeah. Scared, yeah. You know, uh, didn't know what to expect. I'm actually on booking tonight. 
booking. Yeah, so okay. um, I'll be seeing people as they come in. That's a good experience because they're coming right off the streets and, you know, got to be careful, though. But, uh, <laughs> all right, sir. So. Nice, nice to meet you. Nice meeting you, too. Have a good one. Take care. Be safe. Yes, sir. The only thing you're really going to need tonight, to be honest with you, will be your handcuffs and you might need that pepper spray. This is my pepper spray. That's your pepper spray. Okay, so what are the chances I'm gonna to need to use this time? I always try to talk them down first, so don't worry about that. Okay. But it's good to have. That's all I'm telling you, it's good to have. That's the first oh, time yeah, I'm seeing myself. Oh yeah, you always gotta check yourself now. Wow, this is the first time I'm seeing myself in this outfit. Mm. I don't know who this geezer is. I never thought I'd be a screw. Okay. Greensboro is a state-of-the-art modern jail. Every door and every lift is operated remotely from a central control room. 456 cameras monitor the entire jail. Elevator four. Here, everywhere you go, someone is watching your back. So this is a... This is booking. It's booking, right? Mm -hmm. So this is where people come into first. Right. This is where everybody comes in. Mm -hmm. where, where I say, this is where the show begins. That's where they actually bring them in. You'll hear different codes tonight. A 10-10, that's a fight. If you're not in a housing unit and you're not locked down, you're required to respond. And why do I say that? Because you never know when you're going to call and need somebody to come. Over here, this is our dress-out room. This is where they get completely undressed. You have to be in here. It's very, you know, uh, important that you do that search so that he doesn't sneak anything up, you know, into the housing unit. When I first started, guys would put razors in their mouth, put their tongue down, they get to the top, they got a razor blade, they take it and put it on a toothbrush or something that could be used as a deadly weapon. And I've seen that happen. So this is the dress out room here. Okay. We'll walk over here. Yeah. Now I'm gonna show you back here in the back uh, where the inmates that are being very disruptive. I'm ready for the close-up. You ready for the close-up? Yes, sir. How you doing tonight, buddy? I can break this down for you any way you want. Okay, I don't want See, you. I came in here to do some research, and I learned a lot in this time. Right, right. Really? What, what? what are you? I don't see any stripes. Oh, no, no stripes. King. king. But you're the king. MLK. MLK. That's right, MLK. sir. MLK. They forgot one letter. What's that? J. What's the J? He's junior. He's small compared to me. Okay. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. I'm gonna come back and talk to you a little later, all right? Okay, I am the number three, TNT. I'm Dynamite, the number three, baby, Dynamite. I appreciate it, number three. All right. All right, okay, brother. Now, let's say, I was, I talked to him a certain way. He would, you see, he's nice to me now. So mm. you see, I'm not a threat to him. So if, for instance, you didn't handle him well, what would the rest of your night look like with him then? Oh, I'd probably be beating on the door, yelling. As I always say, them three C's though. So, you know, it, it does go a long way. Yeah, so, but we'll see him all night. Oh, we'll wait on you a little bit. Bookings is one of the busiest and most volatile places in the jail. How you doing, bud? We got here. 19,000 people pass through here every year. And it isn't long before tonight's first arrest is brought in. All right, you turn around, put your hands on the wall. You got anything in your pockets that you know about? Put your hands on the wall. Having been told by a magistrate that they must be detained, arrestees are formally handed over to the jail staff. All right, you turn around, take your shoes off, take your socks off, turn them inside out for me. All right, stick your tongue out, lift it up. All right, you can come on in, man. Sit right over here to the right. They're fingerprinted, assessed for threat levels, and given their orange jumpsuits. They're then locked in a group holding cell until they're ready to be taken into the manger. From midnight onwards, the jail gets noticeably busier. So the time is now. I'm reminded that I'm now working in a system that locks up one in 100 Americans and employs nearly half a million people. Uh, turn around, put your hands on the wall. You got anything in your pockets? Nope. You want to go down the center of his back, right? And then work your way around to the front of his chest. There you go. Uh, 
You want to go down both sides of his legs. All right, so you can go over here and you can use the telephone right there and we'll let you know when they have a seat or whatever. Oh, you got one coming in? It's about 10 of them over there. It's about 10 of them over there? Okay, so we getting ready to rock and roll now? Mm. What's your last name, sir? Lloyd. Lloyd. What'd you do? Uh, I missed the court date. For? Uh, for paraphernalia and possession of medication without the bottle. Okay, Lloyd, um, are you suicidal? Uh, are you perceived to be gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, intersex, or gender non-confirming? Inside here, race, sexuality, and gang affiliations are frequently the reason behind violent attacks. Have you ever been incarcerated before? No. Separating people along these lines is just one way of keeping order. People deemed dangerous or at risk are sent to the segregation unit. Okay, question is finished. All right. Last year, I went through this process myself, so I know firsthand how dehumanizing this feels. What is strange is that watching it from this side feels equally uncomfortable. I can't help but feel bad for this guy, regardless of what he might have done to end up here. Okay, so are we just waiting now for someone else to come someone through? Someone process it. Okay. Two thirty, nearly three a.m. Like I really am tired now, and if somebody were to test me at this point, I don't know how I'd react. I'd be worried. Really? It's late in the shift. Yeah. Maybe it's because it's my first time doing this shift. First day. Yeah. Yeah. Ten four. As the night wears on, the inmates become rowdier. Less compliant. Uh, they stop talking. Percy, I'm gonna need number seven. All right, here's what's gonna happen. You're gonna put your hands on the wall. All right, do not move till we leave. Right. Can I call my mom at some point tonight? No, you cannot. No, that's awesome. Okay. Okay. So he's gone in the holding cell. Yeah. And that's because of his behavior? Behavior over there. Being non, he's being non-compliant over there. So therefore, instead of trying to process him like we would normally do, mm -hmm. Just bring him over here till he's ready, you know. So how long typically would you leave someone like him who's had a bit to drink in the whole time? Four, five, six hours. He can't call the bondsman. He can't call his mother. He will have to sit there until he sobers up, and that could be tomorrow morning. I think he's trying to get your attention. Yes, sir. Well, so the advice I can give you right now is sit down and calm down. We'll come back and later on check on you. Yeah, I'll say about an hour or two. Okay, we'll come back and check on you. All right? Okay. Hey, number three. Listen to me. If you have a seat, be quiet. Thank you, sir. It's fascinating watching Officer King in action. Any one of the inmates that came through here tonight could have become violent if they weren't managed right. What he seems to know by instinct and what I'm starting to learn is when to be a friend, yeah. when to be a counselor, and when to be a disciplinarian. It's amazing how um, how different an inmate's behavior is from there, there to there. To there. You see how he broke down on me, now he's starting to cry, because now he sees the reality of where he is. But if you'd have just complied over there, well, you wouldn't be in this situation. He might have even been out of here right. within the hour, right? He could have been. Six is, uh, is the cutoff for my shift. Yeah. Full 12 hours. All right. Good night, Actually, guess what? You'll see him today. I'll, I'll see you today. Yeah, you'll see him today. At <laughs> six o'clock. Okay. <laughs> Thinking oh, back to my time like as an it. inmate in the Texas jail, I remember quickly feeling the guards were the enemy. What's weird is, changing out of my uniform, I already feel the opposite. That the officers are the good guys, and the inmates are the people to be wary of.
Just six hours later, an officer has been violently attacked on a general population pod, identical to the one I'll be working on today. Though not exactly commonplace, it's the sort of incident I've been told is not a matter of if, but when. When you hear that something like that has actually happened to one of your co-workers, does it, does it make you slightly more alert, more worried, more concerned about your shift? Does it change the mood of the building? Oh, yes, it does, it does. Yeah, what, what sort of punishment does the uh, oh, inmate who attacked the officer actually oh, get? He'll be in segregation. Mm. That's a very serious infraction here. Yeah. Yeah. You want to check yourself, everybody? You want to check yourself in the mirror? Before my shift starts, I ask King if I can meet the guard who was attacked. Officer Ledford was taken to hospital after the incident, but has already returned to work. Is there any way you can, you can show me the tape? Yeah. Does this sit here? Yes, that's right. Okay. So she's going around. That's me going around getting the non compliant inmate from my workstation, calling my supervisor, letting them know I have an issue. And he grabs me and tries to pull me in. I did a hip toss to get him down, but then he tried to get the upper hand by putting me in a headlock, is what I believe he was trying. I retrieved my OC spray at this point, sprayed him, made contact, and then delivered several punches towards his uh, facial and head area. Mm. That would be my sergeant coming in to assist me. I'm regrouping, I'm picking up my glasses, put them back on my head. I step up towards the inmate at hand, retrieve my handcuffs, and then get him restrained with the sergeant's assistant. If I wasn't worried before, seeing such a violent attack just moments before I'm due to start my shift has got me genuinely worried. Tonight I'll be working on Pod 5G, alongside two experienced guards, Officers Wallace and Pulley, who have seven years' experience between them. Thank you for showing me around, man. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely, um, definitely, definitely. I appreciate it. There are just three of us, guarding nearly 50 men, whose charges range from driving infractions to violent assault. I've no idea how the inmates are going to react to me. This is a, a room full of grown men. How do you make a room full of grown men do what you, on your own, are asking them to do? They all know what's expected out of them. It's just following the rules, basically. I mean, most of them have no problem with it. I mean, right now, this is pretty quiet for a pod. What is the procedure, then, if a fight kicks off right now, what do you do? So the first thing we do is call lockdown. Call on the radio. TNT, which means altercation fights and It might be this morning's attack, but standing here, even alongside two officers, I'm acutely aware of how vulnerable I feel. I hadn't really given enough thought to the amount of time that the inmates have to consider and think and plan how to get one over on you, and also how to get what they want. And they literally, they notice the smallest things, the smallest things. You walking by, they could be in their cell. And like, hey, at the window, you got a different cologne today. And they check to see your uniform. If your uniform is really wrinkled, dirty, and look, he doesn't care about his job. So yeah. most likely, we're probably gonna be able to get things out of him, the bitch, because he's here for the money. Just another day in the guilty county six, you know? So the whole time they're just focusing on what type of information they can get without you without saying anything. Mm -hmm. I give them just enough that they feel like they know me a little bit, but I don't give them too much where they can use it against me. So when it's calm like this, just hold your corner and just keep up, keep watch, right? They're gonna try you. Yeah. They're going to see, are you scared? Yeah. And they can smell it, tell a mile away if you're scared. Mm -hmm. But it's about just confidence. Just believing that you can do the job and understanding that if things do happen, that we will have your back. That level of suspicion that you have to have here on the inside, does it change the way that you behave on the outside, do you think? Oh, yeah. Uh, restaurants now, I always sit right back towards the wall so I can see everything in front of me. You kidding me? Yeah, because you never know. These, these guys get out. You want to go ahead and hit that round? Yeah. So it's going to be five on the bottom okay. and four up top. All right. I'll do the bottom first and I'll go back up. All right. Every 30 minutes, the officers use an electronic recorder 
linked to a central database to mark that they have checked each cell. It's an official record timestamping that all inmates are safe. Bully says to act confident, but suddenly isolated from my fellow officers, I'm certainly not feeling at ease. A bit of a weird one, really. Because in terms of paranoia, this moment isn't very nice because what's to stop an inmate running in after you and slamming the door shut and then suddenly it's just two of you in the rear yard, not two, you know? I think more people are sort of seeing my face and trying to size me up a little, see how I react, see how comfortable I am. That's cool though, it's to be expected, right? On top of the attack on the guard, this pod saw a violent clash during the night, which has seen the attacker sent to segregation. His victim remains here, under close supervision. So you were, you were fighting earlier. Do you mind telling me what that was over? What happened? Well, dude, dude was watching out the door. He got the door cracked, dog. He was watching out the door. He waits for me to turn my back. Were you expecting the officers to come in and, and, and help? Oh, yeah, yeah. They were. How long was it before the officers arrived out? Immediately. Yeah. Immediately. So in your opinion, what makes a good officer then? Good officer, somebody that treats you like a human being. As an inmate, you earn their respect. You know what I mean? Because they don't trust you. It's like we don't trust them. You know what I'm saying? Uh, trust is earned, not given. You know what I mean? It's beginning to feel like there's a constant threat of violence in here. I'm increasingly aware that no matter how calm things might seem, as a guard, you can never truly relax. <laughs> As the dust settles on this morning's incident, Pulley and I conduct cell searches. He's working on one side, I work on one side. And I'm doing it stripping his bed. And mm. then when you strip the bed and shake it, everything, making sure that stuff is not hidden. Mm. And then a lot of inmates are particular. For example, this is contraband. Suit cut, they're not allowed. Suit cuts in their room. The reason why is. They can actually put urine or feces in this cup and throw it out. So what sort of things have you found on the shakedown then? Um, I said, we found marijuana, cell phones, cell phones, yeah. cigarettes, anything. Where would they hide a cell phone in the cell? They'll have like some type of make a like concoction of like toothpaste. Um, I don't remember exact breeds, but they'll try to hide up here, under here. Like they're just pretty, pretty much anywhere. One of these are going in the trash, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe we're going to bring it to the trash. You want to check, either open the containers, because let's say they were to stash weed in there, you yeah. shake it up, it's no way you know. Yeah. And as soon as we leave, <coughs> they just knock it back out. Hey, why check your pulse already? Like many of the officers here, Pulley was born and raised in North Carolina, a state where 22% of residents are African American. Yet more than 70% of the inmates here are black. I've got to ask you this, man. As a, as, a, as a young black guy yourself, you know, the numbers of young black men incarcerated, even here in this pod, they're, they're overwhelming. Oh, yeah, definitely. So, definitely. why do you think you ended up wearing this uniform and not an orange one? I had a great mom. My mom, she pretty much told me always follow the rules. Um, I just always thought it was an position. I always wanted to be in law enforcement. Do you think there's a stigma against the job if you are a, a young black guy? Oh, definitely. definitely. Sometimes they look at you as um, a trader, like, hey man, you're black, you're supposed to be nicer to us. You know, I don't know what your crime is, I don't know whether you're innocent or not guilty. You know, that's guilty or not guilty, that's not up to me. I'm not the judge or the jury. You know, my job is to make sure you follow the rules and that you're safe in here. By 11 p.m., the inmates have had three hours out of their cells. It's time for lockdown. All right, gentlemen, 11 o'clock lockdown, please, gentlemen. I don't know if that many people were supposed to laugh. <laughs> All right, fellas, I already said it's time to lock down. If I'm in here tomorrow, don't be surprised if you don't come out at 8 o'clock. get off the goddamn. Doing this on my own, I'm not entirely sure if I'd be uh, great at it. I mean, this is an intimidating environment, you know. You've got a lot of people in here who are watching your every move, and for somebody like myself, I think I'd have to be a little bit more forceful and um, a lot more stern. 
for me to be heard and, and respected, unfortunately. I'm starting to learn that officers have to be constantly vigilant. And I wonder if the chronic staff shortages are making these pressures worse. The thing that I would struggle with most if I was doing your job would be um, the hours. I worked 12 hours a day for almost a year straight. And that's, that's overtime? Mm-hmm. Wow. Statistically, I've even read that that takes years off your life. It's, it, 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 it takes a toll. I mean, I don't necessarily fear working in here, but I mean, if you really think about it, if these guys really wanted to take over, it's what, 40 of them are only one of me. So if they all just came and ganged up on me, it's just not really too much I can do, you know what I'm saying? All right, fellas, I appreciate y'all. I'm gonna go ahead and get these lights. I knew that this job puts you in the firing line, that you might be attacked at any time. What I hadn't realized until today was the mental toll it takes. In America, correctional officers have a higher than average rate of mental health problems and are nearly twice as likely to commit suicide. I think tonight was a, a real eye-opener. Looking after 50 inmates at one go is difficult enough, let alone watching what you say being careful and cautious about how you present yourself and also how much you let them in. You know, there's so much to consider, so much to think about that they're on constantly from the minute that they walk into the pod. And that isn't an easy job at all. It's Easter Sunday, and after last night, I'm relieved to have a day off. Officer King has invited me to go to church with him, and I'm looking forward to getting to know the man behind the uniform. How you doing, sir? Good to see you, sir. You too. Uh -huh. You too. You're looking sharp. Oh, you're looking a little sharp yourself. <laughs> so you've got a pretty, uh, pretty scary accessory oh, there. Ah, well, you know. I try to take care of myself when I'm outside of this. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. That's uh, the last thing I expected to see on your belt. Really? In church. So do you normally carry whenever you're out of the uh, the jail then? Yes. Everywhere you go? Pretty much. So seeing you wear that uh, in church sort of says to me that you're almost you're almost on duty, you're not off. You're not you're not relaxed. Oh, I'm always relaxed. Officer King was born and raised in one of the poorer parts of Greensboro a city with neighborhoods among the most deprived in America, and where violent crime is almost twice the national average. It must be weird knowing the people you're locking up might once have been your neighbors. In terms of the people that you see coming through the door mm -hmm. at the jail, mm -hmm. how many would you say on it, in terms of percentage would come from this area? Oh, uh, 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 probably 70% of them. So having a, a history in the tougher corners of this area, do you think that gives you an upper hand in the job? Just to be able to relate to some of what they have gone through, yes. This is our church here. This is the church? This is the church. I'm aware that when he's working, Officer King is presenting a certain image to the world. So it's interesting to hear him open up here but I'm still intrigued as to why he feels the need to carry a gun, even to church. So your family are gonna be where today during the year? So. Um, some will be in the service, uh, some may be over here. So I don't want anyone to walk up to them and possibly, you know, assault them or grab them based off of maybe something that I had to redirect them for, you know, in the jail. You're concerned that a former inmate could spot your family or get to know who you're right. connected to? Too. The congregation is large, so you really never know what could happen. I know that I follow the rules, and most people, especially inmates, you know, they don't always want to follow the rules. Scale of one to 10, what's the threat level, do you think? Uh, to me, about a nine. Should we head in? Yeah. Let's go in. 
Good morning. Good morning. How you doing? Hey, how you doing, brother? Uh, what's going on, man? What's up, man? What's up, man? How you doing? All right, this is Ed, right? Doing, this is Reggie. It's Reggie, good yeah. to meet you, bro. Nice to meet you. Glad to have you, man. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for having me. All right, all right. Yes, sir. After spending three days at the jail, I've learned that during a 12-hour shift, you can't afford to switch off, even for a second. But a threat level of nine in church suggests Officer King finds it hard to relax, even when he's off duty. But what toll does it take spending your working life watching your back? How has that stress sort of uh, manifested itself? Has it affected any of your relationships? Well, as far as relationship, it does. My daughter, her mother, when she lives in Florida, you know, uh, she just could never really accept what I did. If you don't have a real support system where your wife, your family really accepts what you do, it's, got, it's, it's not just tough in the community, but at home. So the job got in the way of your relationship? Yeah. You know, and, and my daughter, she would ask, like, well, why would I want to work in a place like that and someone can hurt you or walk up on us and, and hurt us? All right, man, I'm going to let you get some rest because you've got another another like, shift. Another 12? Another 12? <laughs> OK, man. Thank Take you care. so much. Thank yes, you. sir. Happy Easter to you, too, okay, brother. OK, happy Easter. All right. Sure that they get new recruits. I don't know who's going to be up at this ungodly hour to hear that, but <laughs> well, it seems like he's got the right idea. Whatever it takes, I guess. I'm heading back to the jail for another 12 hour shift. I'll be spending the day on pod 3B, a general housing unit that has a reputation for being rowdy. Let's do it. I've been paired with Officer Owens, one of about 70 female officers working within the jail. So how long have you worked in this jail? Um, nine months. How do you feel going into one of those pods? I feel like uh, a lot of the guys know me anyways. Um, I've sort of developed a reputation. <laughs> for what, exactly? Sending guys out for being disrespectful. And by sending out, what do you mean? Segregation. Right. Sending them to segregation. So, um, usually I try to give people a chance, or a few chances, um, but it definitely depends as to what level of disrespect uh, they show. So what are we talking about? Masturbating, um, cussing me out, things like that is, uh, are usually segregation. So what are you like in your, uh, in your normal life? Um, I'm kind of an introvert. Kind of a shy person, actually. Yeah. Shy? Yeah. So how does Owens, someone who stands at five foot two and describes herself as naturally shy, keep control while surrounded by 50 volatile, potentially violent young men? We are taking over for a little while. So you have, currently you have 43 on post. Currently we were about to start conducting cleanup. The day begins with cell cleaning a task the inmates undertake themselves. Now, I let out um, four per tier at a time because you don't want all the guys out. You only have a limited number of cleaning supplies, so you don't, you don't need everybody out. All right. If you want to clean, press your button. This one, this one, this one. From the start of the day, the atmosphere in here feels much more challenging. Are we going to have a good day today? I hope so. When they say, are we going to have a good day today? They mean, 
you gonna let me get away with stuff? Are you gonna let me do what I wanna do today? And uh, so I just say, I hope we're gonna have a good day, but that all depends on you. You want to clean? Yeah. Okay, give me just a minute and I'll pop your door. Sounds like you've got a, a real handle on this. <laughs> you know how this thing works. How long did you... Um... Fake it till you make it. <laughs> yeah, well, how long were you faking it? I can't say I've stopped, to be honest. Um, I still don't feel as confident as I try to portray. I'm gonna need you to roll those pants down. Trash bag, toilet bag. So generally, how would the inmates test you now? just to see if you stay on your ground. Like I told that guy to roll his pants down, he hadn't done it yet. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna give him a few more minutes. I'm gonna tell him again. Hold on. Don't walk away with that screen up, okay? You need to do what I tell you to do. Don't test me today. Me too? Mate, you fill that one up and come back and get the second one, all right? Hmm? Fill that one up and come back and get the second one, all right? <laughs> I think that was a little cheeky test, then. Lockdown. All right, good. You're not coming out today. Anybody else? I just locked a guy down for the day. You locked someone down? Disrespectful. Yeah, yeah, you missed that. What happened? Um. Well, I said, stand by your door if you want to clean up. They never moved. I said it two more times, never moved. So he's locked down for the whole day? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Which cell was that? 11. Mm. They're about to lose their whole morning rack hour. They keep this up. Oh, really? If you guys want to come out this morning, I recommend you stop yelling out. All right, we have to get a round in. If you'd like to do that, yeah, for sure. I'll give you the pipe. Start my round and go on. Yeah. yeah. Owens locks down the inmates so quickly. If you're just waiting on your floor to dry, I need you to go ahead and shut your door. It's not a punishment I've seen used in the jail before. Y'all yeah, not coming out this morning. Oh, I'm caramel, but in her position, I'm not sure I'd be taking any risks either. You got two guys down on one. Yep. Two. two. They know the rules. Mm. They're just trying to see what they can get away with. Mm. Do you think you've got a reputation for being a hard officer? I think most females do. If you have a male and a female officer in a housing unit with males, they're going to approach the male. Mm. Where do you think that is? A lot of guys don't like taking instructions from women. <laughs> Yes. Can I get some salt? I'll bring you some on my next round. And I need some toilet paper too. Okay. And a toothbrush. Now you might have to get all that when you come out. Well, look, I also need to take a shower. I ain't taking no shower in there. I'm too late. We're finished cleaning up this morning. Your cellmate kind of ruined that for you. Do you still get offended when you're working? I still don't. Enjoy, you know, being called a bitch. <laughs> How do you manage to keep a uh, smile on your face? Uh, you don't scowl. find it. You don't find it glamorous. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry, you can get it when you come out. Do you want to come out? Okay. Halfway through the shift, I take one of the inmates across the jail for their appearance in front of a judge. I'm going to escort you down to your court appearance as well. I take the opportunity to try and find out how inmates feel about Owen's hardline approach. You've got uh, an officer who is really, really hard on you guys. Have you ever considered as to why she might be doing that? For one, she's a female. And another thing she's She's Caucasian in a predominantly African American field facility. So for your white and your and your woman, they're not gonna listen, they're gonna learn. 
as a black man and as a black inmate, when you see a new white officer come in, how do you think they're looking at you? Some of them are compassionate. Some of them are in addition to the problem. Some of them look at it as just a job. You have to deal with people. Like, you have to be a people person to deal with people. If you're not a people person, you can't. I just don't see the point in it. It's interesting to hear it from an inmate. Officers like Owens are given a much harder time here, simply because of who they are. An added pressure, it's not easy to overcome. Why go? Part two. Back on the pod, tensions are already running high, and all the inmates are about to be released from their cells for recreation time. So it's the big rush for phones, right? Yep. Phones and showers. <laughs> it seems like there's mass relief to yeah. be out of their cells, right? Yeah. Mr. Moore, you got a shower downstairs. You do it, you're not coming out this afternoon. What, what, sorry, why they're not you allowed on the upper tier if they're not assigned to that level. So you're going to lock him down for the rest of the day? I am. Yep, as soon as he showers, he's done. Mm. So how many inmates do you have on lockdown at the moment? Six. Is that normal for one of your shifts? Or is that a... That's a, a little high. Yeah. It's a little high. I'd say uh, two or three usually per shift. Mm -hmm. um, there have been days when um, I locked everybody down. Mm. Everybody's having a bad day. This is jail. Busy shift. Officer Owens. Whoa. Feeling stressed? Oh, well, that just happened. This is really, really difficult. This is so difficult because you are just being challenged constantly. It's, you know, for want of a better example, you know, it's like looking after a lot of kids. It is, yes. Kids with um, assault charges and robbery with firearms and, and things of that nature. Yeah. So, you just have to be careful. I found today's shift really challenging, but it's only been one day. Owens has been doing this for nine months. I was thinking earlier, I fucking hate you. <laughs> after that shift, well, directly after coming out of the pod, I was thinking, this is just as hard, if not harder, than being an inmate. It's all shit. Just in different ways. It's my last day working in the jail, which I'll spend in the segregation unit. But before my shift begins, I've been given the chance to speak to Major Williamson, the head of the jail, who's been working in North Carolina corrections for three decades. Hey, how you doing, Major? All right, all right. How's it going? Good, good. Good to see you again. I found my week here tougher than expected. I don't get why anyone would want to spend their working life here. You know, if you go to a third grade class and say, what do, you, what do you want to be when you grow up? Not many of them say, probably none of them say, I want to work in a jail. The challenge there is getting people to see the job as a critical uh, aspect of the criminal justice system. You got to be as, as aggressive as we are in recruiting. Given the amount of African-American men that you have behind bars here, do you think you're seeing enough African-American recruits wanting to be a part of the solution? I, 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 as far as African-American males, no. If you're an African-American, when you go home and you tell your, your wife, your mother, your friends, hey, I'm gonna work for the sheriff's department, there's people who've, who say, hey man, why, why are you doing that? You know, you, you, maybe, you, you sure you're not selling out a little bit? Why do you think African-American uh, officers are important? Well, obviously, it's just like any, any other social entity. Uh, you know, when you, when you see a person who looks like you, maybe you're a little more open to listening to them, you know, understand how to talk to them, all those things make a difference. So, now, if you decide you want to stay, 
It's clear that recruitment, particularly of African-American officers, is the main challenge facing Guilford County Jail. With numbers so low, it's up to the current employees to pull their weight and make up the hours. How are you? This morning, I'm working with Officer Pulley again, this time on the segregation unit. The inmates on this pod are too dangerous to mix with the general population. They're only allowed out of their cells for an hour a day, and only then in chains. How many officers will man this pod then? Uh, it's two officers. Yeah, we could be at two officers just because of safety. Mm -hmm. Just because of just because of safety. Yeah. I have one of the inmates calling you out, saying you're trying to act serious. That sounds to me sounds as though that they know you, right? Yeah, yeah, they know me. Uh, what is there to be done on the pod this evening? Um, right now we got a couple guys that uh, they get their hour outs as Philly was uh, mm -hmm. describing and everything. Uh, actually, we have one guy right here, 20, he's a suicide watch. As you can tell, he's got his jumpsuit on outside. Pretty much we can't trust him with anything right. uh, inside his cell. Right at the moment, he literally has nothing but a blanket. That's so he has. he's put his jumpsuit outside of his cell? Oh, we actually done that uh, per sergeant. So. so what is he wearing? The blanket. Right. We'll let him do the next round. We'll let him do the next round. Next one? Okay. Yeah. All right, cool. Doing the rounds, I'm struck by just how relaxed and affable Pulley is, even on a unit housing the jail's most intimidating inmates. I've also noticed a familiar sound. Number three, the vocal inmate from my night in bookings is the person who's had the contents of his cell removed. When I was doing my rounds, mm -hmm. in the far corner, I noticed um, someone I saw when, um, when I was working booking. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, I was calling himself number three. Oh, yes. So he's in here now. Oh, yes, he's in here now. He's asking segregation for tearing up his sheets, uh, fighting officers, um, spitting, throwing feces, masturbating. He's pretty much broke everything. What was your charge? I have uh, 23 felonies and one misdemeanors. And then uh, I got one more misdemeanor in here for they all assaulted on a government official. So I did it for attempted suicide five times. Why would you want to take your own life? For attention. It was never really suicide. OK. All right, well, look. Good talking to you, man. Look after yourself in here, all right? What's your name, officer? Take it easy, look after yourself in here. Calm the eights, OK? All right, sir. The last time I saw the inmate who calls himself number three was on my first shift. I felt wary of him at the time, and I was a bit embarrassed by that. Hey, Norman, somebody coming out. One week later, I don't feel as phased by it, but I now know that that feeling, being wary, is a good thing. It's what keeps you safe. Thank you, buff. You're doing your push-ups, huh? Thank you. You thank you, buff. You don't get you some weight. You getting big though, man. You get. I see. I see it in your arms, chest. You know. You getting big again. This guy right here, good guy. He always joking with me. Call him Buff Ninja Turtle. <laughs> he gonna put on some muscle since he been here. You the only dude I know and said display in nah display in fashion for trying to smuggle in a wig and a toupee. <laughs> hey. Do you know, do you know what the, the funny thing is, just seeing you guys talk to each other, I think if neither of you were wearing these uniforms and you met in a bar or something, you'd yeah, probably be friends. Yeah, yeah. You'd be friends, right? Yeah. yeah we're about the same age. Pulley has a natural empathy for inmates that they clearly <laughs> respond to. It makes working with them feel easy. <laughs> and it's a great way to end my time here at the jail. Alright, Pulley. Ready? Take care, man. Your relationship with the inmates is definitely different to every other new officer or younger officer that I've seen. You have a real shorthand with them. Yes. Um, and to me, it seems as though you're trying to, trying to make their stay easier mm -hmm. or at least help them in some way. Would that be fair? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I feel like I'm definitely helping because when they come in, I don't judge. I immediately say, hey, I've been there. 
you know, I may not have done the crimes you've done, but I've seen the struggle. And at the end of the day, you can change that. You know, I just always try to remember that we're all human beings and that you give respect, you will get it. Can we try and find Kate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before I leave, I want to track down Officer King to say my goodbyes. I'm nearly out of here. I'm yeah. nearly all done, nearly. Okay. Nearly all done, how are you? Look, with all of the challenges that face you as an officer, why do you keep coming back? Because I want to make a difference in somebody's life. Male, female, Caucasian, African American, doesn't matter to me. I want to be able to make a difference. But I think you've done a fabulous job. Being six days, other than looking tired right now. A little under shade, you look a little rough around the edges. I'm telling you, I'll be all over you right now. You look a little rough. Thank you so much, man. All right. All right, bro. Head out. Good to see you, man. Take look, care. you got my number now. Yes, sir. So, you know, you can give me a call every now and then. All right. And don't pepper spray nobody. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try. Yeah, all right. Said, uh, thank you. Take off, King. All right, man. It's been a hard and often exhausting week. Correctional officers work long hours and they deal with some of the most dangerous elements in society. Day in, day out. This job isn't fun or all glamorous, but it's important. In the age of Black Lives Matter, it matters that it's done well. And so I've got nothing but respect for the people who are trying to dedicate their careers to it. See, I thought being an inmate would be the more mentally taxing. But you're outnumbered if you're an officer. And the power isn't something that comes automatically. That's something that you have to earn. But you're also being tested. And you're also being sized up every minute of every hour of every shift with close to 50 men, all wanting to try you, whether you're a man or a woman, is my idea of hell and I won't be going back anytime soon. They say to understand a person, you have to walk a mile in their shoes. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. Thousands of people fleeing the violence in Syria, crossing the border into Iraqi Kurdistan. I'm going to spend a week living less than 40 miles from the Syrian border, inside the largest refugee camp in Iraq. My family are nervous about me being here, and I'm a little bit nervous myself as well, because this isn't something that I ever imagined that I would be in the middle of. And this isn't something that I can honestly predict how it's gonna go. Since the war in Syria first began, nearly 11 million people have fled their homes in search of safety. The news has been dominated by those trying to cross into Europe, but some five million people ended up in refugee camps like this one, Domiz, in northern Iraq. I can't believe how big it is. It's huge. I'm going to be living alongside 32,000 refugees to try and find out what life is like for those left behind. I'm going in with next to nothing. I don't speak the language. I don't know anyone. There's no one to help me. And I don't know how I'm going to survive in there. As the Syrian civil war rages into its sixth year, Millions of people continue to flee the country in search of safety. Can you give me your passport? 
Domez is one of nine UNHCR sites currently housing Syrian refugees in Iraq. And like most camps, it's now full. This is your number. Okay. Have a seat here. Camp management estimates there are currently 4,300 Syrian families on a waiting list in this region alone, most living in nearby towns. Only those reuniting with family members or deemed particularly vulnerable are allowed in. But I've been told they're willing to make an exception in my case. I have no idea what some of these people have left to get here, how long they've walked, where they've come from. Excuse me, do you speak English at all? Do you speak English? No, no English? I'm gonna try and make this work. It's my first night here and I need to find somewhere to sleep. How do I do that? Oh man, at a final moment. It's nice to meet you. Thank you. Shukran. I need that one. Shukran. Can I talk to you? Hello. All right. How do I survive my first night in this camp? I've got to go. It's possible you to be can assist ask for help, help from, from refugees. refugees. Okay, I'll ask for help. Thank you, nice to meet you. Hello. Reginald Yates, when did you arrive in Kurdistan? Today. Monitor status, are you married, single? single? All right. You haven't been involved in any military activities or? No. This is the first camp? First camp, yes. Just uh, look at your eyes. Do I need to answer some more questions? Are we nearly done? No, no. We, we still have a lot. Oh, there's still a lot? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Full address, last test in UK. London. Do you have a phone number, please? 07935. May I ask about your religion? Educational background, place of birth, and the name of your father. In addition to registration, new arrivals will go through a vetting process carried out by security. It's thorough, and for good reason. The so called Islamic State are known to hide terrorists within refugee camps. So, how many brothers, sisters? I have two brothers and four sisters. Four sisters. Can you list uh, their names, please? All of them? Yeah. I've already given way more information than I want to do to this process. You've got my iris. Take a photo of your face. Now, you, everything that we have discussed, we have to put it in our system. When they finally got everything they need, you can officially become a refugee. Getting in is a bit of a laborious process, but I am an asylum seeker. I have a certificate. And as of this evening, I'm a resident. Hi, I wonder if you can help me. I've been told to come to the reception center. Yeah. Um, apparently, I'm gonna be giving some shelter for the evening here. Yeah? Sure. As a new arrival, the UNHCR have given me somewhere to sleep for my first night. Hello. This is where I'll stay? Yeah along with an aid package to get me started. But from tomorrow, I'll have to fend for myself. I've got a kerosene hob to cook on. A flask for water. Wow, this is amazing. It's a proper full-on care package. There's like a toothbrush in here. Disinfectant. All gifted. Yeah. Soap powder. Oh. A room heater as well. But everything's pretty much taken care of. I think I should definitely get my head down, stay here tonight, and tomorrow find someone to stay with. The Domis camp was established by the UN in April 2012 as a temporary shelter to host the massive influx of people escaping the war in Syria. But what was once just a mass of mud and tents has evolved. The 32,000 residents of Domiz 
have access to clean water and sanitation. 55 miles of electric cables feed the 5,500 buildings. There are two fully functioning hospitals and seven schools, and it is growing all the time. An estimated 500 babies are born within the camp every year. It's full on shopping here, isn't it? I definitely wasn't expecting this. There's a mobile phone shop over there. There's restaurants and bakeries everywhere you look. Look at it. It might as well be in a major city. Look at that. Every property is one of them. Their own water tank. You've got electricity poles all the way down this street. It's a street, you know. It's, it's cemented, it's concreted. You've got roads that are serviced. Just like any other town, it looks like the main strips are full of businesses. You've got a dressmaker, you've got uh, someone selling furniture just over there. And all these little slip roads are residential. When I think refugee camp, I didn't, I didn't think this. I didn't think they'd be selling 55-inch plasma screens. <laughs> I mean, I figured, just in case, I'll take a pair of gloves. Hello. Hey. And a hat. And it is freezing the minute the sun goes down. I'm so glad I got somewhere to sleep tonight as well. Temperatures at this time of year often drop below freezing. I'm grateful for my temporary accommodation. It's technically emergency. Emergency accommodation. So I've only got my bed for the one night. For the next few days, the rest of the week, I guess, I'm fending for myself. I feel proper ropey, though, geez. Just crusty and grimy. <laughs> so, like, I want to just have a shower. I don't think that there are any. My plan is to get out there and, and find someone that can let me bunk up for the night. The camp has 10 main roads and over 100 side streets. Even though roughly 40% of residents travel outside the camp for work, Dom is one has hundreds of small businesses, ranging from mobile phone shops to restaurants, barbers to wedding dress shops. You've got newborns right the way through to people going to school, getting told off in the street, and just living out their lives normally as if they would anywhere else. But people are going and coming. You know, it's not just people staying here trapped. They're actually getting on buses just like that one and going to work in nearby towns. So there's a thriving economy. There are a thriving people. And there are, to my surprise, people who have decided that this is home, which is why they're building properties just like that one. I've been told about an area in the camp reserved for single men, where I might have a bit of luck finding somewhere to crash tonight. I've also managed to pick up a translator for the day, which I'm hoping will make my life that little bit easier. Look at this, you've got literally a tent. It's, it's like tarpaulin, it's sheets, it's blankets. It's whatever they can find to try and keep dry. And an outdoor toilet that it seems like loads of men are sharing. Look at that. Literally siphoned electricity off of the light and whacked one of these in to divvy it up to different tents. That's genius. Probably shouldn't touch it. Let me see if he's in. Yeah. 
Is this your turn? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Good morning. Is this is this your turn? Mala. Right. Do you mind if I come in? Can I see your yeah. can I see your home? Oh. Amazing. I'll take my shoes off. There we go. No, 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 no. There we go. What's your what's your name? Azwan. How'd you say that? My name is Azwan. 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 Azwan, okay. Um, how long have you lived here? Do you think that you can go back home to Syria? No. So were they trying to force you to join the military? Wow. Most of the people that have lived here for a long period of time, they eventually build a, a house. Is that what you're you're trying to do, or what's the reason that you've got a, a temporary structure? So I'm trying to find somewhere to stay. If it's not too uncomfortable for you, would you be okay with me maybe sharing your floor this evening? Thank you so much. These big things on. There are 5,148 individual homes in Domiz, which vary from semi-permanent concrete buildings to semi-permanent tents to more basic dwellings for newer arrivals. But the priority for upgraded homes is given to families with children. This way? Hazwan is still single, but he has managed to secure a plot of land on which he plans to put up one of the UNHCR's larger, more comfortable tents. Just how big is this tent then? The tents are free, one of the benefits of being granted refugee status. Every resident staying in Domiz is entitled to free health care, free schooling, free water, and electricity. I've been told that the local barber here is tying the knot later this week. So I've decided to drop in and see if I can secure an invite. Hello. Is this, is this your place? Ah. OK. So you're getting married this week. Congratulations. Congratulations. How are you feeling about the wedding? OK, so how do you go from a refugee camp like Domis to, to a place like the UK where I live? How would you be able to get your family from here to there? So you'd have to do it illegally? Um, so what is a wedding in Domiz actually like? Well, look, uh, your, your wedding sounds, sounds amazing. It might be a little forward of me to ask, but um, I'm not here for very long. I go on Friday. Would it be possible to, to come to the wedding on Thursday? Yes. Yeah? Yeah. I have to do a black ski family very good wedding. Thank you. That's really kind. Well, I, I'm excited for you. Take care. 
chatting to barbers about their weddings. It's easy to fool yourself into thinking you're living in a normal Middle Eastern Wait, town. Can I get curry? We're just an hour down the road. A vicious battle is taking place to control the city of Mosul, with Iraqi and Kurdish forces fighting to drive Islamic State out of the region. The entire time I've been sat here eating my lunch, um, this lady's face keeps appearing on the screen. And, um, you don't have to be a genius to work out. She's a reporter that's actually died, um, and today's her funeral. And it looks like she's actually died in a war zone. I think it's actually Mo um, Mosul that she's in, which, you know, 20 odd miles from where we are now. If she's not safe, how safe am I? I'm heading back to meet Haswan, who's kindly agreed to put me up for the night in his tent. I feel really out of order turning up at Haswan's without absolutely anything to give him. I'm tempted to buy him some bread. Refugees are entitled to the equivalent of 15 pounds per person a month in food vouchers. But I get the impression that it doesn't stretch very far. How much for one? Even if you can work out how to spend it. 100, how much? 50. Happened here. Oh no, no, I don't want five. No, 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 I don't want five. Just one. <laughs> yeah. Translation. No, 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 no. I need one. One. How much? I oh, got you buy one. Hello. You do it. With the Europa. How much did you pay? Man, I didn't even see what he got out. Is that it? That's how much it costs. Thank you. I know that his place is one of these left turns, but <laughs> I don't know which one. Is it this one? I think it's this one. That's one. It's a little thank you. Thank you, thank you for letting me stay. So, no lights, no heating? So when that happens, how cold do you get at night? And what was it that made you realize you needed to leave your home country? When you realize that you needed to leave Syria at 18 years old, what was it like with your parents when you finally said goodbye? خدای راستی گریکی زحمت بود راستی. نه نه دیجیم. جوی لحظه زحمت درنات یه سریم. خدای من تصویری که عائله تا خو حمی که گل هفده بود من گرت بود جاره که هشت همی بچیک بود من گر خانیت بود. باس من اول از همه بعدی من گله کی خطا من سخت کردی دن من گله کس به تأثیر دم راستی یعنی عائله تا خو متعند بر چه و خو من دیگر یعنی وی تصویر گریک تعداد میکنه. مشيرة <تصفيق> I can't even uh, begin, to, uh, begin to understand how you might feel um, with everything that you've experienced. You 
It got cold last night, didn't it? Yeah, because I'm hot, I'm cold. All right. Um, I'm gonna try and get started for the day. Thank you again for letting me sleep here last night. I appreciate it. Had you said that, I was wrong. I don't remember the last time I was that cold. Every time I started to nod off, I'd feel the cold wake up and instantly think, where the hell am I? What am I doing? And realise how alien this environment feels, but also how uncomfortable it actually is, you know? It's a bit embarrassing, actually. I caught myself looking at pictures of my family. And I think that that came off the back of what he was saying about his. Having the one picture of his family was just too painful. So he cut it up. I love my family so much and I'm part of a big family. I've got a lot of siblings. And in my toughest moments, you know, they pick me up. They help me. So for him to be in this environment and to not have any family here, I don't know how I'd manage that. Home could become a sense of pain because after a certain amount of time, I think you'd have to start telling yourself you might not actually go home. You might not actually get to see those people again. And he's just one of 30 odd thousand people in here. I'm sure he's not the only one that feels that way. Can I help in any way at all? No. No, I insist. Is that how it works here then? Do people just, just help each other for free? Let's take this back. As the eldest son, Hazwan is expected to provide for his parents and siblings in Syria. He sends every spare penny he earns from picking up the odd construction job back home to his family, where earning an income is virtually impossible. As time's gone on here, have you become less and less hopeful that you'll ever return home? Getting home to family might not be an option, but there is a route out. Smugglers operating within the camp offer an illegal service, taking refugees across the border into Turkey and beyond. It's a vast criminal network stretching across Europe, worth an estimated four billion pounds. Many people here are planning to make the journey, including Vanda, the groom I met yesterday. But what exactly does that entail? Hello, you look like you're hello, hello. Good old chat. How hello. you doing? I'm Reggie. Hello, hello. What's your name? I've been told to talk to a man called Mohammed, who lives in the northern edge of the camp. Oh, wow, look at this. This is this is lovely. This is really comfortable. This feels like the most complete home that I've walked into since I've been here. You, you've got trees outside. There's a separate kitchen. Someone was cooking food. How many people live here? أو أفزيكي هاي بايا أصدها ألفين وخمسة عشر حتى نهاية منضاية 
مفقوده تشتك جي لخيا امزع ساغا مريا تشيري هات يمزع افجي يغزاني ونضابيا ما شغلي مولا شبروج بيا ماو شوف قاسي مساج برا عالك هالي مرقي ولا عرض البيضة ماو أبغى Do you want to get some air? Do you want to take two minutes and get some air? No, 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 no. Thank you so much for speaking to me. Take care again. Take care. I think like everyone else, I've seen pictures on the news of uh, refugees trying to find a new home in Europe, uh, going by boat. Um, and unfortunately, not everyone making it. Obviously, there's that famous image of that young child on the beach, and that's just one story, you know? But to actually sit down with a family who, who've lost someone to a similar tragedy is, um, I can't even really put it into words. I don't know. I felt that I knew how I felt about this situation and how I felt about how I felt about refugees trying to make it into Europe. Now I know how I really feel. It's kind of ironic, really, isn't it, when you think that in this environment, you've got all of these people who have pretty much come here with nothing, yet they're willing to help each other. And when you think about people from rich countries who have the space and who have the funds to help them, we don't want to. It's just a bit shit, isn't it? Watching these birds fly over, I've done this all day, <laughs> and I was wondering where they were going to, and it looks like they've been coming here. Excuse me. Where did all of these birds come from? Do you breed? I don't know. Are you calling them in now? I'm Reggie, by the way. What's your name? Amer. So tell me about these birds. I mean, you've got hundreds. How did you end up having this many? I was like, I'm going to go to the house. I'm do you think many people here are um, of the same mindset as you that this is home now? Uh, چیترش خارج ور پشتر کنگی به ما مرا بشید بزی بر سوی به دکی مستقبل ور هی یعنی حتی از جمهور گرگ ور بن گرگ نر. Whatever shape the roots that you put down take, roots are roots, man. And if you've got something that makes your situation feel like home, thank you so much, Cup of Chai. You're not going to leave. Why would you? Yes. <laughs> Pleasure to meet you. I'll keep an eye out for the birds. Okay? <laughs> if I see the birds, I know where they're going. It's hard to say what I'd do if I was stuck in this situation. Onions? This one? Yeah. You're happy with that? Yes. Tomatoes, you said? Tomato. From what I've heard today, to the people living here, 
Europe is a sort of pipe dream. Can I cut anything? You know, cut potatoes? But it's a dream that can all too easily get you killed. So it's alarming to hear that Haswan is considering it. It looks like a bit of a torchlight. Yeah, yeah, he's got a nice little setup. It's good. I, I, it sounds like you're risking a lot. I mean, do you not worry that it could go wrong for you? Do you not worry that it could go wrong for you? Do you not worry that it could go wrong for you? Do you not worry that it could go wrong for you? See you in a bit. Waking up this morning was um, a really strange feeling because it's the, uh, the most comfortable I've felt um, since being here. I don't know if every day it's getting easier or if um, on some subconscious level I've finally accepted that this is my new normality. You know, Haswan has um, he's built a home here, a temporary one, albeit, and he's now been moved up the street where he's going to build something a little bit more strong, a little bit bigger. But to me, it's almost like admitting defeat because the minute that you succumb and allow yourself to put down roots, the chances of you going back home or finding home somewhere else, like in Europe or, or America, pretty much get null avoided. So far, because I've been staying in an area for single guys, I've mostly been talking to men in the camp, but this morning, I've been introduced to a young woman, Fatima, a 19-year-old who came in six years ago. You speak really good English. Um, yeah. Where did you learn to speak it? Uh, Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And Disney. <laughs> what is Disney? And that's really helping. <laughs> yeah. Are you married? No, thank, thank God. I'm single. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't so like marrying, no. Why, why not? No, because I'm, I will study. Oh, yeah. OK. Well, yeah, so if you get married, you can't continue? Yeah, because his husband uh, don't like his wife to uh, working and study. Yeah. Right. So what do, you, uh, what do you want to do then? If you don't want to get married no. and you want to study, what do you want yeah, to go on to do? I want to study. I want to be a translator president. Yeah? Yeah. Are you studying hard then? You're doing well at school? Yeah. And I'm training yoga. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're a proper modern woman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fatima is resolutely single. But within Domi's, she's unusual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Family struggling to cope financially have increasingly seen marriage as a way of looking after their daughters. So what is it like to be a 19-year-old girl in, in Domi's then? I don't Pregnant and hamelin. I never thought that divorce would be an issue here. Masalan kichik ya pichika. Amre shazda ya. Jbar hindi et pichik and masalan numuawa hishta kamil nabwa. Akhutni to hishta et zarokana. Syrians have traditionally married young. But there has been an alarming rise in the number of child brides within the refugee community, with reports of girls as young as 12 being married. Uh, my mom, you know, uh, she's married in 13. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, yeah, 13, yeah. Oh. Is that why you think they're so open to you choosing when you get married as opposed to them pushing you to do it younger? 
يعني حتى نو كجي مثلا الدفع ما عائلة ما تشنا بيتك جك شاذة بيتهدا هجدة دربس نكيت أمي نادن. My father tell me I'm married but as you like. As you like. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> In a camp like the Miz, how do you meet someone? On the street sometimes. If, if you see a boy that you like, would you approach him? How do you. No, get if in touch? I like him, I will just show you I like him. How do you show him that you like him? Oh, can we do it? We okay, and you? yeah, sure. Okay. You, you walk, you walk. Okay. Yeah, like this, I'm walking. He will show he, like this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And after that, he will calling my friend, and you will giving you my number like this. Um, take this paper. Over. Hey, come on, bro. Yeah. Okay. Then go and give that to her. over there. Not just like, but I'm nestling. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Okay. I have to go because I have a course. Thank you. I'll <laughs> Thank see you soon. Thank you. See nice you. to meet you, Fatima. Nice to meet you too. At times in this camp, you can find yourself so overwhelmed by the horror of what these people have been through that thinking about anything else almost seems disrespectful. But Fatima, and I guess a lot of other people like her, seem to be just living in the moment, studying and planning for their future. At some point, I guess you just have to start moving forward. It's the day of Vandal's wedding, and I'm heading over to the barbers to check in on the groom. Where is the groom? Where's the guy? Hello? I barely recognize you. Look at him. There he is. Big day. How you doing? You all right? You feeling nervous? <laughs> I guess the next time I see you will be at the wedding. All right? Good luck. <laughs> I've managed to wangle myself an invite. But with the preparations in full flow, hey. I don't want to overstep my welcome. <laughs> Looking good, guys. <laughs> I'm leaving the camp tomorrow. Earlier in the week, I felt that most people here had accepted their fate. That staying here and building houses meant they'd somehow given up. But people here aren't really giving up. They're just making the most of a terrible situation. When you really start to think about the idea of, in a heartbeat, having to leave everything that you call home and starting again somewhere else, it's really easy to understand if someone said, you know what, I can't do this, and just gave up. But what I've, I, I've, I've experienced and what I've seen consistently is people who have done the complete opposite of that. Uh, being raised in a, uh, in a working class uh, environment, in a, in a council estate to be exact, I know what it means to be in an environment that doesn't have very much and be surrounded by people who are making the best of what they've got. Regardless of the fact that there might be dust outside their front door, there is a pride and um, that pride is is, is, is amazing to see. I've seen homes that have been set up by families. I've seen businesses that have been set up. And there is life here, you know. There are children here who are five and six years old who know nothing else. This to them is home. No one here, to me, feels as if they've given up. It's my final evening in the camp. Fatima, you look amazing. Thank you. Work? And I've managed to get yeah. my hands on a suit for Vandal's big occasion. As I will miss you. I'll miss you too. <laughs> Back home, you can live next door to someone for years and never really bother to get to know them. <laughs> Half the people on my street I've never even spoken to. Why are we holding arms? Whereas here, is this, what's 
People help each other, look after each other, offer you tea after they've just met you, make you feel welcome at their wedding. What an amazing wedding, man, that's incredible. I guess it's a real first-hand experience of what it means to be a part of a community. I just keep seeing faces that I've seen all week. There's people in there that are passing the street, that have served me food in the shops, that I've hung out with and met. It really feels like the entire community has come out to, to celebrate Vanda and his new wife. It's just wicked. Here, everyone is connected because they have a shared history. They know what it feels like to be desperate and in need of each other's help. That's right. And out of that comes a sense of community that's amazing to be part of, however briefly. Beautiful. I was doing this tonight. Yeah. I did this. Party was <laughs> popping tonight. You missed one. <laughs> Where were you? You gonna get married? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> life here isn't easy. I think life here is getting easier year on year. But it's not an easy life. We have heat. <laughs> I think it's only fair that the electric has come on. On the last night. Tankers. 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 <laughs> Even though we don't speak the same language, you know, we unfortunately aren't able to have a full on conversation without some sort of translation. But I do think he knows that I'm thankful for his help because I felt that little bit safer knowing I've got somewhere every night to go to. And that's made being here that bit easier. And that's something that he didn't have. Good night. Thanks again, OK? You're welcome. I love your friend. Oh, <laughs> oh that's very nice. I love you too, friend. <laughs> <laughs> It's my last day in the camp. I still can't say it exactly feels comfortable. So it's good to know Hazwan will soon be moving on to a better place. Hazwan, you ready? Yes. All right, one, two, two three. three. There we go. Hazwan, this one. Do you want to hold this? You're too short. <laughs> Come on, you can get it. <laughs> it's the beginnings, look at this. I am happy. Yeah? yeah? How long do you think you'll stay in this tent for? So you've decided you're definitely going to build here, yeah? Oh, inshallah. When did you decide that it was, uh, it was time to stay? I was like, I don't know if I'm going to go to the next one. I don't know if I'm going to go to the next one. I don't know if I'm going to go to the next one. Are you Fatima's father? Mm. OK. Is Fatima home? Fatih. I'm in the eastern part of the camp to meet Fatima again. Fatima, <laughs> where's your makeup? You look good. Yeah, I know. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Welcome to my world. Yeah, I know. There's a lot. How many sisters do this you have? This is your sister. Seven sisters. How many brothers? Three brothers. Small brother, a this big baby brother. brother. Yeah. Right, wow, so do, does the whole family live here? Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> I can't help but think that Fatima, surrounded by family, is in a better place to deal with the hardships of the camp than someone like Hazwan, who has nobody. Ow! Yeah. Are? Oh, Jesus Christ! <laughs> <laughs> Even if you are living alongside your loved ones, the concept of home can be a painful one. My special place because Syria there and smell Syria. You can smell Syria. Yeah. <laughs> so can you see Syria from here? Mm. This will be the first time I see it. Oh. 
<laughs> Syria. <laughs> Do you miss it? Yeah. What was your home like in Syria? Was it a big house? Yeah. A big house in Damascus. Right. What happened to it? Oh, ISS. By ISIS. Destroyed. Bijim das de khuraj da chave kurka gibji kavali min bu. Das de khuraj da chave wi sari paqi miraj da chave. How old were you when this happened? Fourteen. بس بچیگ بود یعنی هواپیمون رو من گلک حجت کرد و مالایت بر مالام داد. Sorry. Check out Syria then. Oi. You look like you'd rather not look. <laughs> I can't. Why not? I don't know. But I can't. <laughs> we'll look this way instead. Yeah? Is that better? I like this way. This way, this way is easier, yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. The longer you stay in a camp like Domi's, the more you realise it's a sort of limbo. Thank you. Thank you so much. You the refugees here can't go home, <laughs> at least not anytime soon. And Europe is a dangerous pipe dream. Thank you again, Mum. Thank you. Yeah, Come on. <laughs> Look after yourself, OK? <laughs> yeah. Take care, Mum. The majority of people I've met here are stuck with no end in sight. And part of me feels angry about that. Angry that they may not live out the dreams they once had. But at the same time, rather than just giving up, the friends I've made are carrying on, taking back control of their lives and despite their circumstances, making a new home. 